and welcome. Thank you very much. Can you take the next member? Mrs. Herman's chair. Honorable Hammond. Present. Okay, let's see. Let's Mrs. see Hammond. Mr. Thring, chair. Okay, Honorable Thring. Present, chair. Good morning, all. Morning, morning. Chair, um, Ms. Mantasha, chair. Honorable Mantasha. Morning, Chairperson, and good morning to everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we take the welcome, Mantasha? Next. Chair, Mr. Mulder, chair. Honorable um, Mulder. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to all. Morning, 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 Honorable Mulder. Thank chair, you, Secretary. Yes. Ms. Mutahum, Chair. Honorable Mutahum. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mutahum. The next member. Chair, we have Mr. Um, Kathleen struggling to connect, but we will address that, Chair, as well. Um, chair, then we have also apologies, Chair, if you want me to do that, or do we look at the agenda first when we to look at apologies, Chair? Yeah, I think obviously let's see who's connected. And then I think uh, for apologies, we can be able to have that as the next part, because I think we just have to determine our quorum so that we can be able to continue in a representative form. Um, the apologies side. If I may, Chair, um, yeah. we can, the apologies, Chair, is that Mr. Mumuyani will be joining the committee late, Chair. He's just attending to a family uh, matter, Chair. Um, then Ms. Yaku will not be attending today. She's attending, I think, the Justice Committee meeting, as well as uh, the alternative for the Freedom, Freedom, Freedom Front, um, the EFF, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I think uh, um, um, Mr. McPherson, our author, is probably struggling, Chair, so we will try to make sure they are connected. But we can proceed. We have a quorum, Chair, and we can proceed with the meeting, Chair. So I'm sure the members will be actually agree in agreement that we proceed. So obviously, I think we should be able to look at the uh, agenda. Uh, Secretariat, if ever, we can actually fly that because we are representative. Yeah, Chair, um, Mr. Cumberland has joined us, Chair. Okay. Welcome, uh, Cuthbert. Um, let's actually check on the agenda. Um, we're looking at the adoption. The areas which are covered from now is the update on the implementation of the new legislation. And there's also the issue of the briefing of the Competition Commission Tribunal uh, and the issues relating to investigation and cases. So I think um, there is actually a part uh, where we actually were hoping that we will be taking comments, questions for clarity, uh, which is actually an item just before concluding remarks. So if I can actually just make that addition, that we'll have the presentation. There will be actually uh, members' uh, comments, questions, and engagement which is actually immediately after that, and then we will conclude the meeting. So it's an area between the conclusion and the presentation, the briefing. Okay. So can we actually just make that an amendment uh, or acknowledge that an um, um, amendment uh, secretariat? Can I put the agenda before the committee? Let's see if ever the committee is comfortable for us to proceed in the order of the agenda. Honorable members. Chair. Yeah. Ms. Mantashi, Ms. Ms. Mouch, Mouachi, Chair. Chairperson. Yes. I move for adoption of the agenda. Thank you, Honorable Mouachi. Move for adoption. Mantashi. I propose that we second the, the adoption of this agenda. Thank you, Matasha. Can I just check if ever there's any uh, objection? And if not, can I then actually, I know, um, Secretary, that we do have the DTIC team. Uh, if ever we can actually just uh, yeah. uh, get the representative who's present. Um, Secretary? 
Chair, I think Dr. Pule will lead a delegation, Chair, and he will be able to indicate who is all present, Chair. Good morning, Doctor. Welcome. Can I ask that you just uh, give a brief uh, set, uh, introduction of your team and then actually take us through the presentation? Welcome, Doctor, and the delegation. Dr. Pule. Thank you, Chairperson, um, and morning to Chairperson and the members of the Portfolio Committee. I'm here on behalf of the DG and the DTIC. Um, in the delegation this morning, Chairperson, is the, um, the Commissioner of the Competition Commission, Dr. Tembin Kosibona Galicia, as well as his Deputy Commissioner, Hadin Rachitutu IC, the Chief Legal Counsel from the Competition Commission as well, Dr. Bakke is also here. Um, also joining us, uh, Chair, is the Chairperson of the Competition Tribunal, Memondo um, Mazwai. So I will start with the presentation, just giving an overview of where we are in terms of the implementation of the Competition Amendment Act from the perspective of the department, followed by the Commissioner, Tate Bonagele, who will go into a bit more detail in the provisions of the Act from the perspective of the Competition Commission. And then finally, and you will also then touch on uh, with your indulgence and guidance, Chair, your guide, but he's also ready with the presentation in terms of the status of the implementation of the COVID interventions that were done. Um, and the chairperson of the competition tribunal, similarly, Chair, has got a presentation that covers both areas. So the Amendment Act, as well as the uh, COVID update, Chair. Um, with your indulgence, Chair, I will then proceed to flash share my screen, start the presentation, and then following on to my presentation, I propose that the commissioner proceeds and then the tribunal, and then with the indulgence of the chair, we will then um, be open for questions and matters of clarity. With your indulgence, chair. Yeah, I think we will do that, Doc. Take all the presentations and then get to that point as you suggest. The floor is yours, doctor, if you can actually proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. I trust that Chair can see the presentation. Very well, very well. It's... Thank you. Um, I want to see if I need to um, stop video for myself, just so that the network is not clean. Thank you, Chair. Um, this presentation that I'll give now, Chair, is, is a brief overview of the, some of the highlights that will give the Portfolio Committee an indication in terms of where we are in implementing the provisions of the Competition Amendment Act. Um, various sections of the presentation cover different aspects. Um, we'll just start with a quick sense of background um, and then get into some highlights in terms of the provisions of the Amendment Act and where we are in implementing them. And finally, close off with um, elements relating to institutional readiness of the competition authorities towards implementing these amendment acts. Now, there, there is likely, uh, possibly, chair members of the portfolio committee to be some overlaps, as my presentation will just give a, a broad overview and a broad sense. The detail in terms of what the competition commission will say will obviously touch on some of the issues that I would have already just given an indication on. So. Please indulge us if there are any overlaps in terms of the presentations, um, Chairperson and members of the Portfolio Committee. Now, we, we are aware, Chairperson, members of the Portfolio Committee, where the history comes from. Um, um, it, it's, it's very well explained um, in, in the presentations that will come later, in the latter part of this meeting. However, we know that this is this was on the back of significant work that was done in government, significant work that was done by Parliament based on the, the issue of ensuring that um, we open up the economy, deconcentrate the, econo deconcentrate the economy, and ensure that there are greater levels of economic participation. Emphasis is obviously given, uh, Chair, as well as members of the PC, to specific um, sectors of the, of the community which need to be supported to participate in the economy more efficiently. SMMEs, Black-owned businesses, um, and, and, and public interest considerations are a big part of the work that uh, is looked at in terms of the Competition Amendment Act. Now, the benefits of, of the Amendment Act, again, as a refresher, Chair, um, this is information that members of the Portfolio Committee are very well aware of. Um, however, just as a refresher, some of the benefits of the Competition Amendment Act, Chair, 
um, relate to clarifying and broadening the mandate of the competition authorities in order to equip them to more efficiently, more effectively address economic concentration, provides greater clarity to, to, to role players in the economy, as well as enhancing some administrative efficiencies in the work of the authorities. It also gives the executive authority um, some enhanced um, participation powers in terms of major proceedings and other aspects within the, the, the act. Now, as I said, Chair, members of the PC, we are well aware that this is a process that, that took um, a number of years to, to, to get through. It involved everything from I mean, the beginning of the State of the Nation address announcements right through to consultations with various stakeholders uh, through the breadth of, of the country in terms of various stakeholders in, involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the economy and culminating in the president signing the Competition Amendment Act into law February 2019. So, so that was a significant process that we made. Some of the highlights which I, 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 I emphasize in this presentation, which, as I said, Chair, will, will, will be also detailed and in in gone into further by, by um, the Competition Commission and the Competition Tribunal, relate to uh, the buy power and price discrimination, so abuse of, of dominance provisions and regulations that were implemented. Section 1010. Um, COVID block exemptions, which assisted government to react swiftly and, 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 and react and demonstrate an agile ability in reacting to the COVID pandemic, and which worked the Competition Commission and the Competition Tribunal worked with the National Consumer Commission and led with some measure of, of extinction, really. I mean, they've reported on that significantly. And today they also present further updates to the portfolio committee as well as, as, well as members of the public. There are also provisions, a key provision of the Competition Amendment Act Chair relates to Section 18A, which, which is in relation to foreign acquiring firms and major acquisitions. Um, so that is a key provision, which is also um, to be implemented, the final touch-ups, as well as um, work that is being done now um, in terms of ensuring that the, the, the competition authorities continuously adjust um, on the back of the Amendment Act, but also on the back of other imperatives, continuously are just to be efficient and effective and ready to, to fulfill their mandate. So this, this presentation will essentially highlight those aspects. There's more, as you will see in the other presentation, but those are the aspects that were, were, will be highlighted here. In terms of the abuse of, of, of dominance provisions, the, the biopower regulations are one which are important. Um, and the minister uh, subsequently gazetted Biopower regulations relating to that, which which aim really to support fair participation for uh, small, medium, and, and enterprises, as well as firms owned by historically disadvantaged persons, um, which protects them from from um, powerful players in the economy from unfairly suppressing prices or imposing certain conditions to exclude them from participating efficiently. The Commission issued guidelines on that um, relating to those biopower regulations check. Um, as, as, as we know, Chair, um, the minister will issue regulations. The commission is empowered by the act to issue guidelines. So those guidelines were subsequently issued and published on the website of the competition commission. Um, similarly, similarly, Chair, members of the portfolio committee, price discrimination regulations were also gazetted by the minister. Um, I'm also aiming really to support um, your SMMEs and HDP firms in the economy. These, these are critical critical um, aspects of the amendment act, which I highlight here, Chair. As we know that um, really it is, it's important that uh, we give as much support as possible um, towards ensuring the participation of the smaller, medium enterprises in the economy. Um, firms that were that are owned and run by historically disadvantaged persons, also chairperson, members of the PC, required support. And these regulations really are highlighting work that government did and work that government will continue to do to ensure that that support is, is, is practicalized. Um, um, then, of course, there's the COVID block exemptions, which is, which is a more recent, and I suppose um, it, it stays in our memory as we're still under um, um, COVID restrictions, Chair, but essentially on the back of Section 10, subsection 10 of the Act as amended, um, government was able to issue and the minister was able to issue um, regulations and block exemptions, block exemptions in this case, which allowed for, for 
government and, and various sectors in the economy, those sectors mentioned, the healthcare sector, banking, retail, and others, to be able to react to, to the COVID pandemic, to be able to support initiatives in ensuring that the pandemic does not uh, worsen and does not worsen the situation in the country. Now, now the, 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 the Competition Commission worked diligently, worked uh, very well with the National Consumer Commission chair, members of the PC, in implementing and ensuring that these, these, these exemptions that were issued uh, um, are practicalized and, and work is done. The presentation that the commissioner will lead um, will have aspects in terms of reporting on that. So that was a significant one. This one is a highlight, chair, members of the PC, in that um, it, it, it demonstrates the ability of government really to react in an agile and a quick manner. Um, we, we are aware that um, the work of, of, of the Competition Commission, the, the Competition Tribunal, um, often is, is work that is detailed, it's work that needs diligence, it's work that takes time. Um, but during the COVID, one of the distinct um, features that the authorities were able to demonstrate was that even within the environment in which they work, they were able to react quite diligently and, and, and agile and very quickly in assisting government and, and the people of South Africa to be able to manage the pandemic. So, these drug exemptions are significant in that regard. Another significant amendment, which is uh, important in the Act, um, Chair, members of the Portfolio Committee, relates to Section 18A, which relates to measures, proceedings which involve foreign acquiring firms. Now, this section, as members will be well aware, um, requires of the President to constitute a committee which will consider whether the implementation of a measure involving a foreign acquiring firm would have any negative effect on the national security interest of the Republic of South Africa. When as part of that, there are various, of course, there are various provisions under Section 18A. I mean, this is just a, a one slide summary. Some of, one of those key provisions is um, the president needs to appoint um, members of cabinet as well as other public officials as the president sees fit to this committee, uh, publish a gazette of a list of national um, security interests, um, and, and, and other considering the committee for for its for its for its on its part, once it's so constituted, has got obligations in terms of ensuring that uh, major notifications are, are handled within specific time periods, um, as well as ensuring that they are then also uh, published in forms of gazettes and, and the decisions that that committee would then make are published. Now, obviously, um, in order to, to adequately um, implement this, this section of the amendment act, this section of the act as amended chair, members of the PC, it's important that um, the department also puts in place um, technical and secretarial capabilities in order to be able to be the legs and the feet of this committee. This is work that is currently being finalized in the department to ensure how do we structure that technical and secretarial um, uh, structure in the background to support the presidential committee. So it's an important consideration. We are also aware, Chair, that this is these type of provisions have been implemented in various parts of the world. Um, but while this section is, is, is being uh, ready to be promulgated, Chair, obviously um, working with the Competition Commission on the basis of the relevant provisions of the Competition Act, the department does participate in major um, um, major notifications as notified by the by the by the competition commission from time to time um, on behalf of the of the minister. So so that is work that is that is currently being done. Um, it, we are just about at the tail end of, of, of finalizing the modalities of the technical and secretariat capabilities that would then um, allow for the implementation of this of this section of the act. Another important consideration, Chair, <laughs> members of the portfolio committee relates to um, it is one thing as we well know, Chair. To, to have an amendment act with, with, with expanded powers. So that, that's an achievement um, on its own, um, on the back of, 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 of Parliament's um, support. But of course, it's totally another thing for the competition authorities to be equipped and ready to be able to adequately implement those provisions. Now, institutional readiness really refers to the work that was done within the department to look at um, the competition authorities with regard to um, the expanded mandate given to them by the Competition Amendment Act, and to say what impact will those um, amendments have on the financial, human resource, system requirements 
of the authorities, what budgetary challenges is it likely to pose, including um, including the funding model that, that perhaps um, is there a need to look at that again or not. Uh, and critically, uh, Chair, members of the portfolio committee, um, the, the, the work around the institutional readiness of the authorities also looked at, at protocols, internal protocols, uh, particularly particularly with the introduction of 18A to say, um, do we need to tighten our confidentiality um, um, requirements within the department um, in order to make sure that we, we, we keep up the standard that's already well set? Now, it is important to note, Chair, members of the PC, that confidentiality is a non-negotiable. We know this by law. I mean, it's an aspect that the Competition Commission very rightly um, emphasizes and and, 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 and and enforces with great diligence, even in major participation processes that we as a department participate on behalf of the minister. So here it was really a matter of how do we tighten even our additional responsibilities as a system. And some of the key findings that came out of our institutional readiness work that was done looked at, um, we need to, to look at institutional model and structure for the competition commission that allows it to have readily available a combination of analytical, investigative, litigation skills. This one is on the back of the fact that we have to be conscious of the fact that the, the authorities are, are, um, go into um, um, litigation with, 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 with entities, with companies, with organizations that will bring their, their best foot, they'll, they'll step up with, with their best resources. And therefore, we are obligated as well to ensure that the authorities are adequately equipped to be able to match like for like in terms of skills, in terms of competence, experience, and, 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 and the, the expertise that's available. So that is one aspect that we believe um, um, work needs to be done to just look at very closely and, and see where the gaps could be there. Um, the other issue would be around on the assumption that you are unlikely to have all the resources that you need in-house all the time a model of, of, of establishing some sort of a panel of experts, economists, cyber, IT investigators, which the commission could then have access to, to from time to time based, based on various types of, 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 of cases that they would then have to deal with. Now, we know that this is this, the panel, the panel approach is, is approach that has been implemented in supply chain um, processes, um, you know, where you, you have a ready panel that allows an organization to be able to access skills that might not reside in, in house. As we know, not all specialist skills, you, you need them all the time. So it might not be cost benefit analysis to your advantage to have them in house, you might, you might want to just have access. To them. As I said, confidentiality is an important consideration, which is treated really chairperson, it's, it's one of those that we, we simply cannot overemphasize, it's sacrosanct. Um, secure record keeping and making sure that we tighten those loopholes, any loopholes that might exist there. The other key two points as a department that we are conscious of and we are working with um, the leadership of the director general really chair is around the transmission of institutional memory and the cultivation of intellectual capability um, in that, we are conscious of the fact that um, as, as members will be well aware, I mean, um, issues, for instance, that relate to competition mergers um, or market inquiries vary and they change. So from each market inquiry, one is held, this, the other one is that different. Mergers and acquisitions, same thing. Now, how do we as a department enhance our own internal intellectual ability to be able to engage at the consistently high level with, with all the matters that come um, to the department in whatever uh, way they come, whether it's a major notification or it's participation through a market inquiry, as well as ensuring that uh, we build on the body of knowledge within the department. Um, so internally, we have protocols currently, which we are constantly looking at improving in terms of ensuring that we we, we maintain adequate standards and we ensure that we build our internal capacity in the department, critically minding that um, in, the, in the Competition Act, it is the minister who has responsibilities, not the department. And therefore, the work that we do, we are doing really to advise the minister and therefore we have to make sure that the standards are maintained. That's an important part, um, Chairperson and members of the PC, that as a department that we do quite um, insistent on us continuously working on. That, that is also one of the key recommendations that the Institutional Readiness Report advised us to keep an eye on. 
The other issue, of course, out of this institutional readiness is the implementation of a delegation of authority framework that would allow the commission and the commissioner specifically to be able to separate and focus on, 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 on legislative and strategic issues and have operations also handled by an adequately senior individual in the form of a deputy commissioner in order to assist to ensure efficiency in, in the in the in the in the, in the organization. So those are some of the key high level highlights, uh, chairperson, members of the portfolio committee, which quite apart from quite apart from the provisions of the Competition Amendment Act, which the authorities are, um, the authorities being the commission and the tribunal are well equipped to, to lead on and run and, 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 and increment. And the department is, is also mandated, obviously, because of our oversight responsibility, chair and members of the PC, to also ensure that those organizations are adequately uh, positioned in terms of skills, in terms of structure, in terms of funding as well, which is an important part. Um, while, while we are aware that um, while we are aware that we live in a time now where the fiscus is strained, uh, funding has to be used in a, in a very diligent, ever more diligent manner. Uh, public funds have to be accounted for ever more diligently, now more so than at any other point. Um, we are conscious of the fact that we have to balance that against the fact that with increased mandate for the authorities, there will be a need to look at their funding and say, is it enough? What more do we need to do? And how do we creatively work around it? Now, as a last slide, Chair, members of the PC, before I hand over to the, to the competition commissioner, the, the, if you really were to uh, emphasize or pull out um, the areas that the department is, is looking at insofar as implementation of the Competition Amendment Act is concerned, um, one is, is to finalize the implementation of 18A, as I so described. The second is to ensure continued engagements with the competition authorities on in, on internal implementation of some of the state of readiness um, recommendations. Um, I say continued because we know, for instance, that there's already a deputy commissioner acting who, who's, 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 who's assisting um, apart from the, the, the permanent deputy commissioner, but there are two, there are two other deputy commissioners. So there are already engagement in terms of, of taking the recommendations of the state of readiness report uh, institutionally and then implementing them within. The delegation of authority um, framework is also work that is, is currently in process of being finalized. I've mentioned the funding issue. Funding um, will always be an issue, Chairperson, um, in an environment such as ours where um, the, 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 the complexity and the, 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 um, the cases that the authorities have to deal with um, get ever more complex. Um, and obviously, the idea is not necessarily to just blindly request more money, but to be able to knowingly and, 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 and with, with, with a with form of diligence understand where do we need uh, what funding for what purpose and optimize the funding, the limited funding that is available, recognizing that these are public funds, they must be used properly, efficiently and diligently. And then finally, as I mentioned, Chair, members of the PC, we also recognize that as a department, it's not just about the competition authorities, it is also about the department as well. So while, while the amendment act, um, one, one could you know, mistakenly think, look, it's, it's, it's focused on the authorities and, and, and we need to look at the authorities and are they ready? We also need to look at the department and say, is the department um, equipped? Is the department positioned? And is the department building on its, on its capabilities to be able to adequately support the authorities and adequately support the minister and ensure that the amendment is fully implemented to realize the, the objectives of, of, of that thing? So those, that, that chair in a nutshell, is essentially where we are. So, so the long and short of it before the competition commissioner comes in, chairperson, members of the PC, is that um, the competition amendment act was passed. We are busy working hard with the authorities to implement the, the provisions of the competition amendment act. We look at it beyond just the act itself, but we also look at it in terms of the institutional readiness of the system. When I say the system chair, I'm referring to the DTIC, I'm referring to the authorities. Commission and the tribunal to ensure that as, is, as, as a system of institutions, we are adequately um, equipped to, to implement that. And finally, Chair, to make sure that we work with other role players. Um, as I said, one of the 
good examples, really, I think, has been the work that the Commission has done with the National Consumer Commission during the COVID um, pandemic. Chair. So that, that chair brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I shall hand over now, Chair, with your indulgence to the Competition Commissioner with his presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Commissioner. I'm sure you'll be able to fly it, uh, first and then be able to take us through your part of the presentation. Welcome, Commissioner. I'm sure the team will be uh, flighting the presentation and then we'll hand over to the commissioner to take us through. Thank you, Chair. I would appreciate if that could be done from your side. Uh, I seem to be battling to get, uh, I've used uh, Parliament's Zoom, but it seems not to be giving me the options to share. Okay, Secretary. Um, Chair, we made, uh, we made the Commissioner a co-host, Chair, so she should have the ability to share, Chair. Um, but if he's struggling, Chair, we'll see, see how we can assist, Chair. I'll okay. Just... I just asked Margot to, if she can't share the document for us, Chair. And Margot? Okay, Commissioner, it looks like it's being projected. Can you see that? Uh, yes, Chair, I'm just trying to make sure that I've got the right size. I have it, Chair, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So now, it, it now allows me to share mine. So I, I, I will do that quickly if you don't mind. It will be best if the Commissioner is shared, yeah. I, I, I am sharing now, so I, I have it. Uh, I trust you have it, Chair. Okay, yes, I can see that. You know that when you're talking about sharing and other things, it's not English because <laughs> we don't know what you're doing. But we see there's in, every, something going off and on the screen. But uh, th th I, thank you. Floor uh, is yours, Kupina. Thanks very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, chair uh, and uh, I will try in my presentation. I've had two presentations, which is quite a, 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 a tricky. Um, I will try to avoid duplication. So I uh, will just mention that uh, my colleagues, uh, the, the, the DGG, uh, um, as well as the chair of the tribunal, uh, I've had the benefit of seeing their slides. So where there are duplications with my presentation, uh, I'll just skip those, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll inform the members when I do so. It is just to save time. And Thank you. We, uh, as you uh, would uh, all be aware, the Competition Act as we have it came into effect in uh, 1999. Uh, but in uh, February uh, 2019, the Competition Amendment Act was signed into law uh, by President uh, Ramaphosa, and uh, soon after that, uh, it came into effect in July, uh, to be uh, specific. Um, these amendments were quite, uh, were quite major uh, and took place uh, within the backdrop of uh, what I would term a, a fairly successful uh, competition regulation over the past uh, 20 years, uh, especially in the area of cartel enforcement. We've seen major cartels in areas such as cement, uh, construction, uh, steel, uh, food, uh, levying fines in, in, in excess of uh, 7 billion. Uh, and sometimes establishing funds to support firms in some of the affected uh, markets. Besides the success in, in cartel enforcement, the competition authorities uh, and uh, courts uh, 
have not been as successful in reining in abuse of dominance by uh, 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 monopolies. Uh, this is where you have a single firm uh, uh, conduct. You need no cartel. The power of the firm allows it to control uh, markets. Uh, those were, have been quite, quite uh, uh, tricky in, in many assessments that have been done on the work of the commission. Indeed, uh, the commission itself uh, uh, did a, a, a study uh, in 2018, uh, which uh, confirmed that uh, the markets in South Africa were, were highly concentrated. Uh, and, and this was confirmed uh, by, by the World Bank. In fact, the World Bank was the first to do this in, in, in 2016. Uh, um, and virtually almost everybody you can talk to about the South African economy, uh, whether it is the OECD, um, if you like, uh, the, 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 the institutions uh, that would not typically uh, uh, favor interventions in markets, have all raised uh, 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 some problems on how this economy is working, particularly from a concentration point of view. Because you'll recall that concentration, once you have these dominant firms, they impose cost into the economy. So they are likely to reduce the dynamism of the economy and have a negative impact on growth. So that is why everybody is concerned about that. So the amendments seek to address the, 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 the concentration uh, as well as barriers to entry in, in markets by enhancing the mandate of the competition authorities. In slide five, I go into the detail of uh, uh, the objectives of these amendments, uh, but uh, 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 DDG Molefe uh, Pule uh, uh, has already uh, uh, spoken at length about this, so I'll skip slide uh, five and six. Um, and uh, you will see in the substantive provisions that uh, uh, these uh, amendments touch in almost all areas of the competition uh, functions. So let me start now with uh, one of the areas, the area of cartels on slide nine. Uh, as I have indicated, we've been hugely successful in pursuing hardcore cartels uh, and now uh, there is an acknowledgement that uh, there are also other forms of catalyzation that warrant uh, a, a similar attention. Uh, so there the, the has been a provision uh, in the, in the uh, uh, Competition Act Section 418, uh, which uh, made, uh, created a, a prohibition or a, a, an offense in terms of the Competition Act without a penalty. Uh, that is collusion, any collusion that is not price fixing, uh, market allocation, or bid rigging. So any collusion that's outside of that uh, was not regarded as hardcore uh, and did not attract a penalty for the first time offender. So all of those uh, have now been removed. We call these yellow cards because it's almost like a warning when you are found guilty. Uh, you, you will not be fined. Uh, only the second time around would you be fined. So the act, has, the, the amendment has done uh, away with that, and that section is already in operation. Uh, we, we, we also have had a, a, a market div division uh, a, a definition expanded to uh, cover the allocation of market shares. So sometimes we found that uh, firms can just agree on what market shares to hold in markets without necessarily agreeing on the prices. And that will have a similar effect as that of market allocation. And so all of those learnings have been carried through uh, into, into these amendments. Uh, the other amendment, which I think is uh, quite uh, uh, crucial, uh, is that now for second time offenders, uh, the penalty has been increased. Uh, so there is uh, now a cap of 25% uh, on, on, on turnover. Uh, there is also an amendment. This is just a procedural issue for those who are interested in slide 10. Uh, so uh, this is the, the, the prescription clause uh, in the Competition Act and is found in section 67. 
uh, where it says that uh, we may not, uh, uh, where it used to say we may not uh, initiate a complaint uh, if uh, the conduct ceased uh, more than three years uh, ago. So, um, it, it, and, and this has been interpreted as uh, 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 preventing us from even investigating the matter. And the difficulty has always been that as a competition authority, you can't really know the date when the conduct stopped. Uh, and so that was uh, introducing a, a difficulty that you could not even investigate, uh, let alone to refer. So that too has been corrected because now we can investigate. The only thing we may not be able to do is to refer that case to the tribunal for adjudication if in fact our investigation reveals that uh, it occurred uh, more than three years ago. And also there has been some strengthening of our system uh, in the form of fines for criminal offenses uh, in chapter seven of the, of the act. These are, these are, are fines uh, uh, and penalties for failure to appear uh, when you have been summonsed uh, uh, and so on. So you can see that uh, there is a, an emphasis on, on, on compliance. Uh, section five, uh, similarly, you, you know, section five uh, is uh, um, similar to section four, except that it, this one applies to uh, firms that are at different levels of the, the value chain. So similarly, the yellow card provision has been, uh, uh, has been removed there. I should say that uh, for those who may be worried about uh, uh, business, uh, that uh, this uh, section uh, has not come into effect. It only will come into effect once there are regulations that uh, uh, clarify uh, how uh, that uh, 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 is to be interpreted uh, and enforced. Uh, and so that, that, that re those regulations are still uh, outstanding. Uh, the other area of emphasis on these amendments has been the area of abuse of dominance. You will recall that in my the, the beginning of the investigation uh, 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 presentation, I emphasized uh, the concerns about high levels of concentration. Uh, so when a firm is, is uh, dominant, one form of abuse uh, of that uh, dominant position is to charge uh, excessive pricing. Uh, now we've had huge uh, 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 debates in South Africa about exactly what an excessive price is. Uh, it was even defined uh, in the law. Uh, and whenever we attempted to enforce uh, the law with such definition, uh, I think we often fell short. We've had some successes at the tribunal, uh, but uh, I think that analytically this just proved to be so complex uh, for, for, for us to be able to rein in this type of conduct through the court system. Uh, and that's partly why we had to go back to the drawing board, to the policymaker and say, maybe you can clarify this and make it more flexible. Uh, so now uh, we, that definition has been deleted because it has been found to be unhelpful. In fact, it's a definition we got from an old uh, 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 foreign case uh, which uh, also uh, does not meet our uh, circumstances uh, well. Uh, so now there is a shift in burden of proof on the dominant firm to show that a price is uh, reasonable if there is a prima facie case of an excessive uh, uh, pricing. Um, the analytical framework for assessing uh, uh, excessive pricing uh, also requires determination whether the price is higher than a competitive price. So in other words, there's a, uh, now uh, uh, introduced a concept of a competitive price. Uh, and so uh, you, you look at whether the difference between a competitive price and the price that the dominant firm is charging is uh, uh, unreasonable uh, by taking into account a variety of factors. That leaves a, a quite a, 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 a wide scope uh, for, for doing this. For an example, uh, those list of factors uh, are non-exhaustive, uh, but they are helpful. For example, they, 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 they do guide us that we now can look at the prices in similar markets uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, we now can also look at a, 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 a rate of uh, return. Uh, we, we, so, so there's a combination of factors we could now look at to arrive at whether 
whether a price is excessive uh, uh, or not, rather than having a static uh, uh, definition. So we think that is going to be helpful. Uh, we have not had this uh, tested in law. Interestingly, the, 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 the uh, now test uh, for an excessive price is in the context of price gouging uh, during, um, during a, a national disaster. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the COVID cases. The other area which has been uh, uh, strengthened is that of uh, exclusionary conduct. Again, where dominant firms exclude uh, other firms from participating in the market, uh, uh, there has been a yellow card provision here as well, where uh, some of the conduct could not attract a penalty for first time offenders. All of that has now also been uh, removed. In other words, all conduct that is deemed uh, to be a contravention uh, in the sense of exclusionary conduct can now attract a penalty. And I think that there is now also an expansion of a, a, an exclusionary act to include uh, participating in uh, by, uh, by, by uh, SMMEs, uh, participating in a market by SMMEs, as well as historically disadvantaged firms. In other words, the ability or opportunity of such firms to sustain themselves uh, in markets. That's really been the key aspect uh, of, these, of these amendments. Um, the other major area, really major area of these amendments is that of uh, unfair pricing or other trading conditions. Uh, this is what uh, is also sometimes referred to as buyer power. Uh, a new prohibition of unfair prices or unfair trading conditions uh, um, required uh, uh, that there be a ministerial uh, determination that will designate sectors where these provisions would apply. Uh, you, you, one of the concerns here was you would have a flood of complaints because by its very nature, this conduct includes, uh, uh, entails contracting between suppliers and their customers. Uh, uh, so uh, if, you, if you have all of the sectors of the economy subjected to this, you literally would cripple uh, the enforcement agenda because uh, there would be a complaint about all of these contracts. So I think the law tries to, to open up space uh, so that uh, 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 SMMEs and HDIs can participate in this, but also make it practical to to enforce. Um, and um, there is also an anti avoidance clause. So you may not avoid to do business with SMMEs uh, or HDIs uh, in, in your sector purely because that sector is now subject to these uh, uh, provisions. Uh, and, and the major thing is that uh, there is a shift in the, in the burden of proof uh, to the dominant firm if there is a prima facie case uh, that. Um, uh, there is uh, unfair pricing uh, uh, by, by dominant firm. Uh, as I've indicated, this contemplates a, 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 a ministerial uh, regulation. Uh, the regulation has, in fact, been published by the minister, uh, and the designated sectors are food and agro-processing, uh, grocery, wholesale, and retail, as well as e-commerce and online services. So if you like the food value chain, uh, as well as uh, more uh, general uh, retail environment, whether uh, bricks and mortar or, or, or e-commerce. So in order to further clarify uh, 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 how these would work, uh, the commission has issued uh, uh, guidelines with details uh, on the interpretation and enforcement approach. So in other words, we are on track in, 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 in enforcing this. In fact, there are already uh, 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 cases that we are looking at uh, using these provisions. Uh, uh, and we can talk to you about, about those with, with time uh, permitting. Uh, but I'll jump now to the next aspect, which is that of uh, uh, price, price discrimination. Uh, price discrimination, the major thing that uh, has been done, because it's an old provision, uh, the, but the major thing uh, uh, here that's been uh, done is uh, that uh, 
the there is now a, a new species that is aimed at uh, 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 preventing discrimination specifically against small firms or historically disadvantaged firms. So if the discrimination is uh, seen to be likely to uh, impede the ability of SMMEs or HBR, HDIs to participate effectively uh, in, the, in the economy, uh, the, the burden shifts to the dominant firm to uh, explain how that uh, uh, is uh, uh, justifiable. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, price discrimination provisions uh, remain as is, uh, except uh, this emphasis that I have mentioned uh, relating to SMMEs and HDIs, because we found that, in fact, uh, these are the ones that uh, also tend uh, to be the victim of, of this, uh, uh, if you like. So uh, the, the provision has come into effect. Uh, we are just looking also now because the, the, the minister has also done a, a ministerial regulation on this. We are looking at uh, doing further guidelines to further clarify uh, also how we are going to enforce uh, 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 this uh, from the commission uh, side. But remember those guidelines are not, uh, are not uh, uh, mandatory. In other words, it doesn't mean that the section uh, is not enforceable. We just uh, are, are using it as an aid to both um, the industry, uh, but uh, uh, also to people who may want to complain so they know exactly how we would uh, analyze and assess such complaints. So let me also uh, uh, jump now into another area, which is exemptions. Uh, I think uh, uh, the DDG has also uh, uh, discussed this uh, the major change here, which was extremely timely uh, 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 before COVID, was to create a category of uh, block exemptions that could be granted uh, by the minister uh, on our advice uh, for, for certain industries. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, effectively used uh, basically to allow industry to uh, deal with COVID-19 shocks, economic shocks. Uh, and we'll discuss that when we discuss the, 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 the block, uh, the COVID-19 cases as well. Uh, on measures, I think, uh, uh, again, DTG has uh, dealt with uh, the issues around uh, national security, the provisions around that. So uh, let, me, let me skip that. Um, then market inquiries, I'm on slide uh, 24, I'm, I'm trying to conclude. Uh, the, the, the provisions here are also effective. Uh, basically the aim of the market inquiry was to now elevate the outcomes of a market inquiry uh, into binding uh, uh, findings. So uh, as you know, in the past, the market inquiries we had uh, would lead to uh, recommendations uh, and uh, it was up to the parties whether to implement the recommendations or not. Uh, the, the amendment allows us now to uh, effectively, without even going uh, uh, any further step after the market inquiry, to have the market inquiry uh, uh, outcomes enforceable. I should uh, take the opportunity to uh, uh, say that uh, um, of course, this is an area that is developing, uh, that uh, we, we, we're quite uh, excited with. Uh, just last week, we confirmed uh, an outcome of the market inquiry as an order of the tribunal. So that was a creative way of making sure that the recommendation becomes enforceable and binding. Uh, so we had to make it an order of the tribunal uh, that uh, the long-term exclusive lease agreements by the large uh, retailers uh, are, are, are done away with. We just reached an agreement with ShopRite Checkers, which was uh, confirmed by the tribunal last week. Uh, and today, I think you will be seeing in the media that uh, we've also reached uh, an agreement with Pick and Pay, uh, also doing away 
with these uh, with these uh, exclusive uh, lease agreements. I have just given uh, just for for your own uh, 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 reference a table uh, that gives you uh, the list of these sections that have come into effect and those that are not effective. But basically, they are all in line with what uh, we've discussed. Uh, I think this next slide would have discussed the impact of these on the operations uh, and resources of the commission. I think DTG has done a, a, a good job uh, or, on this. So I also will not take any more, any more time. Uh, with that chair, uh, we conclude our presentation on, on, on uh, 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 the, the, the amendments and what we've done uh, so far. And therefore with your permission, I will immediately jump into the presentation on the COVID-19 cases. Yes, that's in order, Commissioner, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm, I'm just uh, also trying to, to, to share this. And I have, a similar, I have a similar problem, so I can just ask uh, the Secretaries to, to share that, uh, that presentation. Uh, because simi apparently when you share, only then does it allow me to access your system. Secretary. Chair, we'll ask Margot to share the document if she's can. Okay. Uh, Chair, whilst they, 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 are, they are sharing, I, I, I'm also going to uh, here uh, do the same thing. Uh, a lot of this is gonna be also covered by the chair of the tribunal. So I'll skip some of the slides. Uh, the only permission I'll require of you is for our chief economist just to talk you through uh, in the conclusion about the food price monitoring work that we've been doing that he adds. Uh, Chi, uh, if the commissioner can stop sharing, please. Uh, okay. I'm sure commissioner had that. Start uh, sharing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, the problem I have is that I don't, uh, yes, I now, I now have some control. Thank you very much. I sh you should now be seeing my latest yes. slide. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah. I, I will uh, jump some of the things that I've already said uh, and um, and go straight to the work uh, that uh, we've been doing. Um, so the first thing that uh, I'll talk about is uh, the regulations. Uh, so the DTG has already mentioned that uh, immediately we had this national disaster, there were regulations that were, that were propagated uh, by the minister that uh, prohibit uh, dominant firms from charging excessive prices uh, for certain goods, and there were specified goods and services. And these were mainly basic food and, and, and consumer items, medical and hygiene uh, uh, supplies. Uh, there were also regulations for block exemptions, which were published uh, to uh, enable business to coordinate in order to respond to COVID-19. As I have said that uh, these were these uh, block exemption provisions amendments were quite timely because uh, I think the uh, government was able to use these to, in a way, relax uh, competition laws uh, in sectors where there was a feeling that there was a need for uh, much more coordination uh, 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 um, in order for South Africa to secure the supplies and services uh, that uh, it needed. There were also special tribunal rules uh, which enabled uh, the uh, COVID-19 price gouging uh, cases to be heard on an expedited basis. The tribunal chair will talk about that. Uh, we have had uh, block exemptions covering uh, the sector, the health uh, sector, the banking sector, retail property sector, hotel industry, liquid fuels, uh, wholesale, uh, uh, industry, 
uh, all to ensure that uh, the country remains uh, uh, remained uh, uh, safe when it comes to uh, supply and functioning of the economy. Now, coming to the investigations, just to, 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 to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, we uh, on slide eight, we, we got, uh, we got uh, uh, more than 1,700 uh, complaints, which, is, uh, uh, which are complaints we got uh, in the period of uh, 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 three months mainly. Um, and uh, these uh, far exceed complaints we would get in the whole year. Uh, so our system was, was quite uh, uh, challenged. Uh, both uh, the system of receiving complaints, uh, responding to them uh, during the lockdown, I think uh, was quite a was quite was quite a challenging one. Uh, and the complaints uh, 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 related to the items that I've mentioned, things like masks, protective gear, as well as uh, certain uh, food items, we decided to pursue these investigations. As Section 8 contraventions. We've discussed Section 8 uh, previously, which is a prohibition uh, uh, of excessive pricing uh, by, by dominant firms. Uh, and uh, the minister, in terms of these regulations, uh, made provisions on how an excessive price in the context of price gouging during a, a national disaster should be evaluated. And I think the chair of the tribunal We'll also talk about about this. Uh, the the uh, just to emphasize that uh, these provisions only apply because they are abuse of dominance. They only apply to uh, dominant firms, uh, and there is a threshold for dominance. Uh, so any firm um, that uh, is uh, uh, accused of dominance must have a turnover of five million uh, and be in possession of market power. So if you like. That's a jurisdictional requirement. So a small spaza shop uh, somewhere cannot be accused of dominance if it doesn't meet uh, the threshold of a 5 million uh, turnover. This is why, Chair, I should mention upfront that uh, there should be no expectation that we are going to be able to investigate everybody who might have been abusing uh, this period of time because the law doesn't allow us to, to investigate uh, 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 micro enterprises that have a turnover below five million. The excessive pricing uh, uh, investigations were from all provinces, uh, with Gauteng uh, being the the, the, the the leading province in terms of uh, complaints. Uh, but it just shows you that uh, we got complaints uh, from virtually everywhere, with Gauteng leading, followed by by, by uh, uh, KZM, uh, and that followed by, by the Western Cape. We also uh, have categorized these products. I've already mentioned them, which categories are. We then followed the multi-pronged approach to resolve uh, the cases. I think the most uh, effective and perhaps was uh, the, the, the one that uh, uh, is not uh, well acknowledged. Uh, is uh, that uh, we resolve a lot of cases through proactive uh, advocacy. Uh, we reached out to business itself uh, uh, to understand their business models, encourage adequate supplies, and limit panic buying, and dissuading them from profiteering from, from the crisis. Uh, and, and, and advocacy also uh, entailed communicating the investigations and processes so that we, we can educate uh, and raise public uh, awareness. Uh, we also had to encourage uh, the public to report these cases through various uh, uh, programs, uh, especially through uh, the media, including uh, social media. The second uh, enforcement mechanism, uh, uh, mechanism of dealing with this, of course, was enforcement, uh, which is always a very big an important uh, one uh, for us. This is the stick of the competition uh, uh, commission. Uh, so uh, we, we prioritized uh, this investigation. We literally had to uh, restructure the organization, the entire organization uh, to get people working and focused. Uh, we formed the joint operations uh, uh, team uh, 
together with the National Consumer Commission uh, because some of the cases were better suited uh, to be tackled from a, a consumer protection laws. Uh, and as DDG uh, Kule mentioned, uh, we worked quite well uh, with, um, with our colleagues uh, from the National Consumer uh, 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 Commission. Uh, we settled a lot of uh, uh, these cases as well. So not all of them were contested cases at the tribunal. Many of them were also cases against uh, 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 firms that were scattered all over uh, the country, pharmacies and so on. Uh, people uh, who really didn't want to be distracted by investigations. And when they were told they had done wrong, they owned up and they were prepared to settle. The two cases that went uh, to to uh, the tribunal on a on a, a, a contested basis were the Babelehi uh, case as well as the Diskem uh, uh, case. Uh, those cases uh, uh, were were quite uh, uh, um, uh, difficult for us, but at the same time, we were, were having facts that we thought were very were very strong. Uh, because the price increases and the price margins were quite high. For example, in Babelehe, we saw price increases of uh, uh, facial masks from uh, about 40 rands per box. Uh, so from 40 rands to like 500 per box, which was quite a huge uh, increase with a markup in excess of 500%. Uh, so that uh, I think is a very strong uh, factual background uh, uh, to the case, um, and, and the matter has been uh, uh, appealed to the Competition Appeal Court, uh, and we are waiting for that outcome. I should mention that that outcome is going to be quite important for all other cases that we are pursuing uh, in this space. It's going to be a precedent-setting uh, case, and we're all crossing our fingers uh, about where the court uh, will land up. The DISCAM case uh, was uh, uh, also another interesting one, but DISCAM withdrew, withdrew its appeal uh, here. So I think the case we're looking forward to is Babelef. Uh, the, the outcome of uh, uh, um, these completed investigations that I, as I have achieved uh, has been a lot of settlements. Uh, we've tried to really prevent abuse in the settlement. So we've included in the settlement orders a corrective action such as to restrict margins uh, in most instances to about uh, 20% uh, during the national uh, uh, disaster, which we thought was a fair and reasonable uh, 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 margin, which in normal markets uh, would be a good margin. We also included uh, uh, penalties uh, or donation that bear some relationship to the excess profits that were earned uh, so the donations were to charity organizations, old age homes, as well as the, the, the Solidarity Fund. Uh, we've done everything to make sure that the uh, illicit uh, profits uh, that were, were, were earned uh, during this period uh, somehow were, 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 were discouraged, we, we, we managed to have them paid either to solidarity or in the form of penalties. Uh, the total amount for these penalties and uh, 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 donations was 15.4. You'll see from the tribunal uh, the number for, for, for penalties in, in terms of consent orders. Uh, we've now uh, 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 shifted our focus. Uh, these were cases uh, uh, where the, the consumers bought from retailers. We've now shifted to cases where um, the, the, the public sector was a purchaser. Uh, so the procurement of uh, uh, PPE, uh, we're getting a lot of information from the fusion center, uh, which brings together all the uh, relevant law enforcement agencies looking into PPE procurement and, and, and related corruption. Uh, ourselves are specifically looking at uh, at uh, uh, price, uh, excessive pricing uh, uh, to, to the public sector. Uh, we also uh, uh, received specific referrals uh, regarding uh, the purchase of PPE 
uh, by SAPS, as well as the National uh, Health Laboratory uh, Services. Those cases are still in our system and we are still investigating them. We've already referred to, uh, to the tribunal. I think the chair of the tribunal also talks about this in her slides. Uh, and so we, we will be looking forward to it. Uh, we, we've uh, been engaging with uh, all of those engaged with this work. The Auditor General, for example, uh, has highlighted uh, some of the overcharging by suppliers of, uh, of PPE. Uh, we are looking at this. Uh, of course, uh, one would have expected that the public sector would protect itself uh, uh, from, from these uh, true procurement processes but it does seem that there are instances where there, there has been a clear price abuse. Uh, it is at this stage then, Chair, that I would like uh, my colleague to, to just talk, uh, and we are just concluding now, uh, about the other piece of work we've been doing during the lockdown, which is uh, very, very important, and that of monitoring uh, prices. So if uh, uh, our Chief Economist, James Hodge, uh, could be permitted to talk briefly about this work. Okay, Chief Economist. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, as the Commissioner indicated, uh, right at the beginning of the crisis, we embarked on, on the monitoring of food prices. And this was primarily because there were complaints about the price of maize and wheat going up in, in the um, SAFEX commodity trading market, as well as just the price of essentials at that period of panic buying and lockdown. So while some complaints might identify specific abuses, I think one had to take a, a more systemic view of what is happening in the market during this crisis, how the markets are functioning, and also to inform a lot of the advocacy work which uh, the Commissioner spoke about. So, so initially we saw in the first price monitoring report um, identified that, that in the, the lockdown level five period and, and the lead up to that um, in the week of panic buying, that, that really the depreciation of the RAND had caused a lot of the globally traded um, commodities like wheat and rice to go up in price. And the panic buying had also you know, resulted in, in, in a, a spike in demand and, and that was exploited by some retailers, um, but it also had a ripple effect into the wholesale markets for fresh produce and, and the like. In terms of the advocacy work that, that did stem from, from that, um, before I come to the actual monitoring, there was extensive engagement with some of the bigger food, uh, food producing um, companies in terms of the essential products of things like bread um, and milk. And, and in fact, that advocacy resulted in quite a degree of price restraint, but also clearer guidelines um, to those companies about their pricing behavior. Because whilst some of the prices um, for rice or wheat were going up in international markets, the stock on hand would have been bought at a cheaper exchange rate and at a cheaper price. So that ensured that, that uh, the price of these commodities didn't go up during that initial period of lockdown um, and was delayed and sometimes at some cost to the companies involved. But at least they had the clarity and guidance as to, to how we would in, in examine their pricing. In terms of, of the actual investigations and why some of the monitoring became necessary, looking at just this first slide is, we started to notice that um, you know, not just that prices gone up in some of the wholesale markets, but there were quite big differences across prices in the economy. And that, I suppose, is the advantage of fielding something like 1,700 complaints from all around the country, that very often we reduce the market to our experience in a metropolitan area. And as uh, members of this committee rightly pointed out in, in our previous engagements and as consumers revealed, you know, in in rural areas um, where people are poorer and incomes are more stretched and there's less employment, um, often the prices are going up far more substantially. So this is one of the elements we looked at in the food price monitoring report that we just put out. And what we found, just looking at fresh produce markets, which um, there's a, many of them scattered across the country, is that the pricing varies quite considerably across, across them. And, an example you've got here is of onions, um, 
which are closer to four and 50 kilogram in springs, but um, more close to six and 50 in Mtata. And very often we're finding that, um, you know, the Eastern Cape in particular has higher prices for a number of these commodity markets. Now, some of these may be explained by differences in logistics costs, but in fact, the food price monitoring report identified that that's not really the case. Um, that very often you'll have big price differences between, for instance, the fresh produce markets in Swane versus Johannesburg versus Springs or Peter Marinsburg versus Durban. So, so those don't always explain it, nor, nor where the um, products are grown. So in fact, apples, which are predominantly grown in the Western Cape are more expensive there than, than in other parts of the country, um, which is, is something that needs further investigation and explanation. I think the second thing we identified was that these smaller fresh produce markets are far more volatile in their pricing because they're smaller um, and, and one would say less liquid markets that uh, you see far more um, movements in price. And so, so that is something where, where we need to, again, I think, identify how that market feature can be uh, corrected to ensure that some of these smaller markets are more consistent in their pricing. The other thing we've looked at, which is a slide before you, is the spread between the wholesale price and the retail price. Very early on in the, in the process, farmers complained that in fact, prices started going down in their wholesale, wholesale markets for fresh produce, but they weren't seeing this on the shelf. And again, we've just got a couple of examples here of potatoes and onions, um, but where StatsSA data has finally been released, and shows that, in fact, um, if you look at that wholesale retail spread, whilst there may have been some increase in wholesale market prices for, for these products at the time of lockdown and, and the immediate sort of aftermath of that, in fact, the retail prices went up far more substantially than, than the wholesale prices would indicate. And as a result, retail margins um, greatly expanded onto this. So we are are looking um, at stats as they had a, a broader set of essential products to see whether there is a need to in fact go back and, and, and investigate um, these more carefully. But it raises the, the, the common adage from, from, from farmers and consumers that you know, prices are quick to go up and slow to come down. And if you look at the margins over time, that's precisely what one sees that um, at a time when, when um, prices started going down in, in uh, wholesale markets that retail doesn't always follow um, quite quickly. Lastly, just in terms of, of the stability, and uh, we've got maize and, and some of the top um, fresh produce vegetables here. In general, there was a bit of a spike um, coming into the beginning of lockdown. So, so there, there is, um, if you look at the fresh produce, most of them go up at the beginning of lockdown and the immediate aftermath. Um, and with maize, that middle spike in price was, was around the, the sort of March, April period. But the bumper crop has stabilized prices there. I think the stabilization of the rand and the appreciation from where we were, which was closer to 1950 to the dollar, has also meant that these prices have stabilized. Um, but I think, uh, I think you've still got within things like fresh produce some seasonality now kicking in. So despite the sort of initial disruption to the market, hopefully these are playing out, but I think it's highlighted some features that we need to be cognizant of going forward and to ensure that, that essential food prices remain um, affordable because I think that's going to be essential for, for the years to come, um, or at least the next year, um, as we, we sit in a recession and consumers are under pressure. Thank you, Chair. Chair, thank you. That's it from, from our side. Okay. Okay, I think okay. Uh, we will then. Yes, can we, uh, can we request that the uh, Commissioner stop sharing the document, Chair? Commissioner, okay. okay. And then we can actually then uh, pick up uh, on the last part, the tribunal, uh, Ms. Maswai Mondo, uh, will be the last part of what we need to look at. Um, Secretary, I'm sure um, 
the commission now is will be, will stop sharing so that we can be able to pick up on the next and uh, the last presentation to be able to actually get to the, the committee members to pick up. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, we, we were waiting on the other commissioner to stop sharing. Yeah, the, okay. Ms. Ms. Swai has the right to, to share chair, so she should be able to, sh to share. The okay, okay. Well. All right, Com tribunal. We'll actually ask for Ms. Mazwai. Good morning, Chair, and uh, good uh, morning to the members of the committee. If you would please morning, be uh, just to uh, put up uh, the slides so I can share with the, the members. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Chair, has the Commissioner asked us to share the document or will somebody else in the uh, division share the document, Chair? I didn't get okay. the first part. I am sharing the document, uh, Secretariat. Okay, Secretary. So, Chair, I'm going to be covering uh, two items. It's a, a pleasure to be here to present uh, on the work that the tribunal has been doing uh, in two respects. The first being the COVID cases, and then the second being um, an update on the amendments uh, to the Act and the cases that have come before the tribunal in that regard. I'll start by talking about uh, the national response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The members will be aware of the national response, so I will not go into it in much detail. What I'll do is I'll focus on that slide on page four, specifically on uh, two uh, responses by uh, uh, the national government, which have then impacted yeah. the work of the tribunal. The first date uh, on that slide is the 19th of March, which is when the minister issued the Consumer and Customer Protection and National Disaster Management Regulations and Directions. I will speak a little bit more about that later. Then the second is uh, the date of the 3rd of April, um, where the minister issued regulations on competition tribunal rules for COVID-19 excessive pricing complaint referrals. Against the backdrop of the national response, the tribunal response was then as follows. On the 17th of March, um, which is two days after the president declared um, a state of national disaster, the tribunal issued a COVID-19 uh, directives, which informed the public that the tribunal will continue to hear matters on the roll as scheduled until further notice. We implemented a social distancing protocols, um, we implemented a, a register process and procedure for visitors to the tribunal hearings, and we also made provision for uh, staff with comorbidities and um, other uh, um, ailments which uh, required self-isolation. Following that, on the 26th of March, um, which is after the, um, the day of the national lockdown, uh, we issued a further directive uh, for the staff to work from home uh, in compliance with the national lockdown. We made provision for electronic filings and virtual hearings. We also prioritized matters relating to the COVID-19 excessive pricing and referrals from the commission. Opposed uh, mergers, uh, which we regard as complex mergers, were not placed on the roll. And this is because these are cases that usually require the hearing of oral evidence with witnesses in the box, um, where uh, evidence is led by the witnesses rather than uh, arguments being made on the papers. And therefore, those matters were shelved. Uh, similarly, complaint referrals, uh, which did not relate to COVID-19, 
were also put on hold. Then on the 6th of April, we issued uh, further directives. This is the uh, 6th of April was three days after the minister had issued uh, regulations about procedures in respect of the COVID cases. We then um, quickly issued directives to deal with um, uh, the time periods for the filing, and we truncated uh, the process of hearing these cases. It has been said, I think, by the commissioner that in general, some of these cases can take a long time, particularly excessive pricing cases. Uh, to date, uh, there had been only two cases that were prosecuted, being the Sasol and Asalomital matters, um, which took years um, before the tribunal and eventually before uh, the, the, the higher courts. This uh, process of truncating the hearing entails the tribunal undertaking to complete these uh, hearings within a period of seven to 14 days, depending on the circumstances, but also dealing with consent orders uh, that um, uh, would come before us within a period of 24 to 48 hours. On the 9th of June, when we went into level three lockdown, we made provision for matters to start being heard on site, although in reality, we haven't uh, uh, had them on site because we have continued to work uh, well through teams uh, virtually. Complaint referrals that were also removed from the role have now been put uh, back uh, on the role with provision to be heard uh, in the office with the limited uh, arrangements that we have in terms of social distancing and the necessary protocols. Turning then to um, the tribunal's uh, work in this period, we um, looked at the period March to September, March being when uh, the lockdown commenced. Um, and in the six months of uh, the year, just on the COVID cases, uh, and lockdown period, we've had 87 matters, and we've just done a comparison with the work that was done in a similar period last year. And um, in that time, uh, there were 68 cases that the tribunal had had uh, in that period. What we have uh, discerned from the information that we have is clearly that merger activity has uh, dropped due to the economic downturn. And what we have seen instead is an increase in uh, complaint uh, proceedings, particularly those relating to the COVID-19 uh, excessive pricing complaint. This is then borne out by the numbers which are on that slide on page six. You'll see in the period March to September 2020, um, we had 52 consent orders compared to the period prior where we had uh, 14 consent orders. We, in the period uh, 2020, we, uh, March to September 2020, we had uh, 32 large mergers, whereas in the prior period in 2019, we had 49 mergers. It's consistent with the drop in the large mergers that I referred to earlier. No changes in respect of intermediate mergers. And in respect of uh, this year, uh, obviously there is uh, the COVID-19 excessive pricing cases which would not uh, be there last year because that wasn't uh, relevant. Moving then to the next slide, it's just a, a pictorial indication of uh, the work that has occupied the tribunal uh, in the six month period, uh, March to September. And you will see that 45% of the work has been COVID related cases um, and 55% has been the other work that the tribunal does on a regular basis. So I think 45% is quite a, 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 a big number and, uh, and indicates that uh, the COVID process, uh, cases have really uh, kept the tribunal uh, very busy. In terms of the cases that uh, we have heard, uh, the products involved um, included face masks, and sanitizers, um, eggs, uh, fresh ginger, and maize. And these are all items that in terms of the regulations issued by the minister were identified as essential goods necessary uh, for, 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 for combating the 
the, 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 the pandemic. And then the firms involved in, in these excessive pricing uh, violations included uh, pharmacies, both uh, local and, 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 and those with a national presence. They included hardware stores, wholesalers, as well as food retailers. And then just some interesting information about where most of the cases have come from. Uh, the numbers are indicated there um, in the third bullet point and that uh, the numbers are consistent with where economic activity mostly lies, with Gauteng having the most number of cases and Limpopo uh, um, uh, the least, together with Northern Cape and Mugumaland. The penalties uh, that uh, have been imposed on these firms uh, that have been found to have charged uh, excessive prices is an amount of 8.3 um, million, and it's important to note that that number does not include donations that have been made to the Solidarity Fund or other charities of choice of the relevant uh, firms that were found to have contravened. It's also important to mention that not, uh, penalties were not imposed on all the firms because some of them uh, are small firms uh, and therefore uh, no penalties were imposed in, in that regard. The next slide just provides details of where the penalties um, have come from in terms of the parties who were uh, fined and the penalty uh, amounts that were levied against them. Then to come to the opposed uh, cases, we, we have in the period had two cases that were highly contested before the tribunal involving excessive pricing. The first one is the case of uh, Babelehi, where the commission alleged that it had charged excessive prices for face masks. Um, Babelehi contested this uh, on the basis that it wasn't a dominant firm. The commissioner mentioned earlier that dominance is defined uh, in one respect in terms of the turnover that a firm has, which is a uh, turnover of, of, of 5 million. Uh, another element to define dominance, which is a requirement, is a market share of over 45%. However, the Act also defines um, the market uh, dominance as either having a market share of 45% or if a firm has market power, it can be considered to have um, uh, to, to be dominant. And so with the case of Babelechi, because it was a small distributor of masks, um, with a small market share, one of the contested areas was whether it could be found to be dominant without the requisite market share. And on the evidence that we had before us in terms of the prices that were charged, it's important to also mention that the analysis of the Babilefi case was done in terms of Section 8. I mentioned that the minister had issued regulations that uh, made it... Um, a prohibited uh, practice if a dominant firm charged an excessive price. Uh, he did, the, the regulations also provided for a benchmark against which to measure whether a price is excessive or not. And that benchmark was determined based on the date of the margins or markups uh, in December 2019. The reason being that in December 2019, before the pandemic, prices at that time would have been considered to be normal um, and, and competitive. And therefore, the price increases that were seen in the Babelechi case um, were increases, as indicated on that slide, by 592% in February and 987% in March. What um, we couldn't find in the evidence that uh, was presented before us was any reasonable explanation for the price increases uh, compared to the price increases shortly before the pandemic um, in the December period. And because there was no valid explanation um, that led uh, the tribunal to conclude that that was evidence of uh, market power, uh, even though the company, uh, the, the, the did not have a market share of 45%. Uh, 
Um, the important points to note about this is that the market power uh, assessment uh, was was bolstered by the fact that there were uh, supply interruptions. Uh, there was a high demand for the product. Uh, there was limited movement by customers who, because of the lockdown, were not able to shop around. And there was also limited imports because of the ban on uh, travel restrictions and imports. And therefore, the disruption in normal market uh, and supply conditions indicated that there was a failure in the market and therefore that failure in the market conferred market power on a firm as small as Babelehi. And therefore, uh, without any explanations for the price increases, the conclusion was that indeed there was an excessive price and an abuse of the dominant position in the context of the pandemic. The penalty that the tribunal imposed was 76,000 uh, rand. This um, exceeded Babelehi's excess profits, which uh, were about 30,000 rand. Uh, the reason uh, for the penalties was taking into account the sections in the Act that govern uh, the determination of penalties, and those include the seriousness of the offense, of, of the offense. and indeed, uh, because the pandemic is a life-threatening um, uh, disease, uh, it, it was considered serious to uh, a serious contravention. It was also in, in order to um, play a deterrent effect uh, on firms in the market in the context of the pandemic. The Babelefi decision has since been appealed to the appeal court and it has been heard and we are awaiting judgment uh, in that matter. The second case was then the DISCAM case, um, also involving a, an allegation of excessive pricing for surgical masks. The price increases in that context ranged between 47% and 261%. Uh, similarly, the tribunal found that there was no evidence of uh, any corresponding increases in cost, um, and therefore found that the prices charged were excessive and impose a penalty of 1.2 million. This came appealed to the Competition Appeal Court, but it has since withdrawn its appeal. Then to turn to cases that are still pending on, 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 on COVID-19 complaints, we have two uh, which the Commission has referred. One is against a, a company called Blue Collar Occupational Health, uh, and the second one is against the Tumani business enterprises. These cases are different to the Babelefi and Diskem uh, excessive pricing complaints in that the um, price uh, increases and the effect of the excessive pricing was not on the consumers directly. In these two instances, the price increase is to the state uh, because both of the cases involved tenders that were issued by the South African police. The matters are still pending currently and will be heard uh, in due course once pleadings have closed and the matters are ready for, for hearing. So we can't speak much about them at this point. Then if I can turn to the Amendment Act, um, the DDG and the Commissioner have covered the reasons for the amendments, um, which came into effect on the, on the 12th of July, 2019. But in essence, the um, amendments were intended to address the high levels of con concentration and the lack of diversity in the economy, as well as to address a spread of ownership uh, that was found to be lacking in the economy and to deal with barriers to entry and encourage broader participation in the economy. What I'm going to do is to then turn to some of the cases that have, uh, since the amendment came into effect in 2019, come before us, uh, which touch on some of the amendments to the Act. I'll do that by looking at mergers, and then I'll look at prohibited practices later. On the mergers side, uh, we are required in terms of the Act 
to protect the public interest. And when we are deciding a merger, some of the considerations we have to take into account are saving jobs uh, and promoting and promoting worker participation um, and the public interest of particularly historically disadvantaged individuals. We also are required to look at uh, small businesses and ensuring that they're able to participate in the economy. Um, while also looking at foreign direct investment and ensuring that um, the, 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 the foreign direct in, uh, investment is, 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 is still, uh, uh, markets are conducive to attract foreign direct investment. Looking at saving businesses and also taking barriers to entry. Then the, the next uh, three slides speak to the cases that have come before us specifically on saving jobs. Um, there are about 10 examples of these cases in the next three slides, so I won't go into each one of them. It's safe to say that in the 10 cases that are indicated there, uh, significant job savings were made uh, by um, imposing conditions on the mergers most of them being by agreement uh, by the merging parties uh, to, to, to the moratorium on retrenchment. And this is the next slide indicating the cases on, 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 on job savings. And this is the last slide, it's about 10 cases, uh, just as examples of, of, of such cases. Then turning to the aspect of the amendments that deals with protecting worker participation um, and in the interest of historically disadvantaged individuals. We had one case, uh, Simba and Pioneer. Simba uh, is owned by PepsiCo, a US uh, company that sought to buy Pioneer food. One of the elements of the amendments, which is a new provision in the act, is a provision that uh, requires the tribunal to look at the levels of ownership by workers in the firms that are merging before the tribunal. And this is the first case in which the levels of ownership of the workers uh, was uh, before the tribunal for decision. The issue was whether the merger would result in a dilution in the levels of uh, ownership by, by, by workers and uh, more broadly by historically disadvantaged uh, individuals. The uh, emerging parties agreed to a, an ownership scheme, which would ensure that the uh, workers would have a, uh, would be beneficiaries of, of, of the trust and that they would continue to be uh, owners of um, shares in the um, merged entity. The Foshini merger is one that um, came before us uh, as a merger that was intended to uh, save jobs uh, because it arose out of the EDCON uh, business rescue process. Uh, I think it's common knowledge that uh, EDCON has been in um, financial distress for some time and they have been in the process of business rescue. So Foshini was one uh, transaction where there, there were job savings, as mentioned in the previous slides, but in addition to that, there was an, an undertaking to maintain the existing uh, procurement ratios with the local suppliers, which speaks to uh, the small business development, uh, which is then the next item on that slide. Simba um, um, comes up again here, specifically in respect of the development fund which it uh, agreed to create uh, to the amount of 600 million in order to develop uh, small businesses. Bondi PLC, um, an investment of 150 million to assist the local communities. And um, the other two cases also speak to small business development, the Senvest and Marinvest uh, uh, merger transaction. Foreign direct investment, Simba again comes up with an investment of 5.5 billion uh, over uh, five years. And in respect of uh, saving businesses, um, Senvis uh, was a failing firm, as mentioned, because Senvis had been in financial distress for, for some time. Edcon is a similar transaction which 
was a business which was under business rescue, as, as mentioned. Um, and we allowed the merger in uh, order to allow the businesses to be to be rescued, uh, uh, as well as to in some of the transactions. Edcon had a few transactions. There was the retailability one. There was Poshini because there was a sale in different um, of different parts of the business, and in each one of them, uh, where local supply could be uh, secured and job secured, um, that 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 happened. Finally, coming to the issue of um, tackling barriers to entry, uh, we had one uh, merger, which is a merger which was uh, prohibited. Uh, the uh, merger was a merger in which NASPERS, the NASPERS group, was going to acquire We Buy Cars. We Buy Cars being a large uh, um, car buying service, which would then be combined with NASPERS. Um, various entities that are crucial in the market for car buying services, which include uh, OLX, which is an advertising platform and a fairly large uh, advertising platform for the sale and purchase of vehicles, also including the auto trader brand in the stable of NASPERS, as well as um, other um, platforms which uh, uh, would uh, see the intersection of the car buying service as well as the advertising services, which uh, led to the conclusion that this would lead to a substantial lessening of competition, as well as increased barriers to entry um, in the relevant uh, markets. And therefore, the transaction was uh, not allowed. We have since subsequently um, it's been reported that we buy cars has been bought by a new entrant, uh, and that transaction is not before us. We don't know whether it will come before us. Then to turn to prohibited practices, um, what we have seen before us uh, are emanating from the amendments are market inquiries that the commissioner also spoke to. There have been three matters which were settled um, uh, by the Commission uh, and, and have come before us as consent orders. The two involved uh, the data services market inquiry in which Vodacom and MTN agreed to settle with the Commission. And the settlement, the essence of it is that, uh, that it would lead to reduced headline data bundle prices, which affect mostly um, lower end uh, consumer groups. That was confirmed as a consent order by the tribunal. And then the grocery retail market inquiry also led to the commission and the uh, ShopRite agreeing, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, uh, that ShopRite would remove exclusivity in more than 400 stores in non-urban areas where ShopRite has a presence. And this would allow small um, businesses to be able to operate and enter into those markets where previously they would be precluded because um, ShopRite en enjoyed exclusivity uh, in those areas. That then is the work uh, that we have done in respect of those two aspects, COVID-19 as well as the amendments. Thank you. Okay, um, Secretary, I think there were just um, a few slides that were not uh, flighted, which we missed, but I'm sure in terms of the inputs, we we're able to get through to that. But I think uh, let's actually thank the uh, tribunal chair uh, for the input. Can I just maybe, um, unless maybe there's any further uh, final point from the chair, so I'm sure the, the presentation is actually covered. And I'll come back to the members of the portfolio committee to be able to, you know, make their comments or and or questions uh, to the presentations that we have just received. Can I open the floor to honourable members on questions for clarity and or comments? Uh, okay. Yes, we Secretary. Have Mr. String and Mr. Mulder at the moment, Chair. 
Stream and uh, Honorable Mulder. If you can check it, the Honorable Tring. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I think firstly, uh, we want to appreciate the work done by the department, uh, the Competition Commission and Competition Tribunal. I think as you've correctly indicated, Chair, some of the presentations uh, were not complete uh, and didn't tally with uh, what we have and what was sent to us. So. Uh, if we could actually get the complete presentations, I think that would actually help, particularly those slides that were missing. Uh, but Chair, just quickly, my questions then are uh, as follows. Obviously, I think for those of us who have travel around and, and maybe go to uh, do oversight um, or just, just, just uh, party and parliamentary work, it is obvious that we have many foreigners occupying some key SME businesses uh, particularly in the in the rural areas, uh, the employees here are largely not locals, and this works against our local SMEs and our historically disadvantaged person firms. So, how does the Act protect our local SMEs and our historical disadvantaged, historically disadvantaged persons from for foreigners in this space? Uh, some who are here legally but more in particular, those who are here illegally. Uh, the second question, uh, Chair Z, the commissioner uh, presenting on the uh, Competition Amendment Act mentioned that one of the weaknesses uh, that they have is dealing with monopolies. Now, now perhaps um, this should be better defined as uh, olig oligopolies. Uh, and whether it's monopolies or oligopolies, these have just an adverse effect on the economy uh, and the indigent as cartels. So how can this weakness, the weakness of not being able to uh, limit the effect of monopolies or oligopolies um, and, and what is being done, if anything, to, to address the weakness? Uh, Chair, thirdly, <clears throat> the third aspect I've raised before, and, and that is that the <clears throat> The victims of price gouging and, and price fixing uh, are the taxpayer and, uh, and, and the indigent and the poor amongst us. So fines are levied and at times amounting to millions. And what we've seen presented is just over 8 million in terms of fines uh, that have been issued to those found guilty. Um, but the victim, however, gets no recompense. And, and this, to me, is morally wrong. Uh, we must look at, at ways to recompense the victim. Uh, whether that be lowering the prices to a specific, uh, for a specific period um, and using the fines collected to help grow our SMEs and our HDP firm sector as examples. And then uh, my next second to last question is uh, on the settlements, was the 20% reduction corrective action to prices or price margins uh, based on the increased price or the original price before the price increase. Because if it was based on the increased price, where some prices have been inflated by as much as uh, 500 to 800%, then a 20% reduction will still have some of the firms smiling all the way to the bank. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, what intervention can be used? I think the economist was presenting on this, but what interventions can be used to address the uh, price stickiness uh, in connection with the uh, wholesale retail sector that he spoke of. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay, can I take uh, Honorable Mulder? Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you to all the presenters. Let me first also appreciate the work that the Commission and the Tribunal has done. Um, the competition Commission and the Act has indeed got an important role to play in ensuring and overseeing a fair business environment in South Africa. Um, so let me say from the outright, uh, myself and the party that I represent very pro-localization, the development of local economies, um, enable these small medium enterprises to, to flourish. Um, it is however, confirmed in the presentation that when the Competition Act 
was first passed in 1998. The main objectives was to address the legacy of the le uh, legal cartels, monopolies, uh, highly concentrated markets, and the exclusion of black people in the mainstream economy. It is also stated that the policy objectives of the act is to open the economy for great investment, greater investment in new businesses, the focus on opening up space for small, medium enterprises and black owned business. Now, if we really want to create jobs, job opportunities in South Africa and create an ideal business climate um, and integrate, uh, well, for, for small, medium enterprises to, to, to um, strive and sustainable, we should educate a highly skilled population of motivated entrepreneurs. Um, these entrepreneurs should not be functioning in the culture of entitlement, but rather on healthy business principles. Now, as my colleague, um, Honorable Thring, also stated, state capture and corruption has already left the economy in a very weak and unfavorable situation. Um, even before COVID-19 and, and with COVID-19 even making it worse. Now to enable us to achieve the goals of the DTI and the Competition Commission as enshrined in the act um, to create economic growth is a very key factor. Uh, economic growth is, is, is very, very much necessary in these circumstances. Unfortunately, South Africa has not experienced economic growth for quite a while. Now, in a weak economic environment, a very delicate balance has to be found as far as sustainability and buying power is concerned. The balance of the scale of the Competition Commission should be more um, in creating a fair business environment and not merely to redistribute resources according to legally enforced quotas and racial-based codes. Now, Chair, my question to the Commissioner with this background he would be to Commissioner Bunakele. If he can assure me that the implementation of the Competition Amendment Act of 2018 and the conducting of the business of the Commission and the Tribunal in enforcing the regulators, uh, regulations, especially in a challenging economic climate, the focus will indeed be on overseeing a fair business environment and not mainly about redistributing existing resources. Thank you, Chair. Um, can Chair. I just check it further? Yes, uh, or uh, Secretary? Chair, uh, we have, Mrs. Hermans' hands up, but she lowered it. I don't think she's that's still the case, but Mr. Mantashe and Mr. Mbuyani, Chair. Mantashe and Mbuyani. In that order, Honorable Montasse. Thank you very much, Chair. I also want to appreciate the presentations that we have just received, Chair. Well, as they were presenting, I just uh, a question just come to to my head with the extended mandate of the Commission. Uh, where the presentation said they had to uh, appoint deputy commissioners, two of them. And I thought of that and I compared it with the contraction or the reduction of budgets. And I want to ask how are they going to manage that, that, that point, Che? Uh, yes, I know that those, the, those boats are, are a necessity in the commission, but uh, it's also a fact that budgets of entities has been reduced. How are they going to manage it? Okay, we appreciate the interventions that have led to saving jobs of our people during this period of COVID-19 change, but we also wish that it could be a it could happen that they, they save jobs going forward even beyond COVID-19, if, if there will be a beyond COVID-19. But Chairperson, I have seen, I've observed the, the interventions they've done in as far as, as price hikes are concerned. 
during this period of COVID-19. But I had submitted earlier on when, when in the middle of the pandemic, and I made a request to the commission to make an investigation of the prices of eucalyptus oil, which eases the tightness of chests for COVID uh, positive people. I don't know whether it was because I submitted this, this request as an individual, and I want I wish to submit it now to officially that they must do that investigation because its price has hiked. It is three times the original price that we know. And I request that this be, be taken into consideration, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Honorable Mbuyane. Honorable Mbuyane. Uh, Chairperson, uh, good morning. And uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Chairperson the uh, opportunity. Chairperson, let me first acknowledge uh, the, uh, the presentation. Uh, and uh, I have just some few clarity seeking questions around those presentations. Maybe I'll start with uh, one of the competition commission. Uh, can the commission update the committee on the situation of possible abuse of dominance uh, in, in the fishery industry? Second one, uh, uh, Chairperson, the competition cases are prolonged and small business and consumers continue to suffer while the case is on. I just want to check what measures can be implemented as an immediate intervention on allegations of collusion, abuse of dominance by big business. Is there any need uh, to develop a regulation, Chairperson? Uh, the other one will be the issue of uh, the state of competition in the healthcare center, specifically private healthcare center and regulatory uh, failures and high barriers to entry, hospital licenses controlled by few uh, big players. Uh, the last one from the commission, I think we can get an update in terms of uh, the implementation of the Committee Amendment Act, which was signed uh, uh, 2019, Chairperson. Then coming to uh, a, a tribunal, uh, can we just be clarified in terms of the turnaround time on queries or cases, Chairperson? As I indicated earlier on, that cases are being prolonged and uh, are not being uh, 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 fixed. Uh, also, can we be in, uh, informed in terms how uh, do cartels get involved in water and sewer issues, Chairperson? Uh, moreover, I just want to check how do the, the, the triple PEE policy influence the adjudication in terms of the tribunal? The last one, Chairperson, will be any example or Eskimos behind the uh, reported uh, for collusion behavior, Chairperson? That would be the last one. Thank you for the opportunity. May, may I check uh, Honorable Hammonds? If ever that you still wanted to say something, because uh, Secretary said there was a raising of your hand. Uh, Can I check? Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my apologies. You know, when we're on these virtual platforms, we get other di disturbances. But thank you very much for acknowledging me. Um, I want to take this opportunity, Chairperson, to thank uh, the Competition Commission. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I want to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Competition Commission and the tribunal for the good work that they have been doing. Um, we've really had an opportunity to, to sharpen our tools that we have in our work box in order to protect um, abuses within the sector. So 
we have seen this and how the the minister's ability in terms of legislation to impose block exemptions has assisted us during COVID-19 as we went into the state of disaster and we had to quickly uh, attend to what was needed in the in in to to fight uh, COVID-19. So it has uh, allowed us and given us the space to be uh, quick to respond to address critical challenges. Um, so that is where we can see the, 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 the effect of the amendment. And it was good that it was in place. On the issue of penalties uh, of 10%, I think we must, as a portfolio committee, um, propose that we revisit the 10% because it's 10% and then for a second uh, offense, it goes up, et cetera. But I think 10% for a big player in, the, in, in, in any sector, it can just be a little slap on the wrist and next time uh, we'll do it again. So I think we as a portfolio committee uh, must look at the penalties that are imposed and how it can, we can make sure that it is more punitive so that the big players who, who, who transgress in the field can, can be made to feel what our what their wrongdoing has, has, has done to the to, uh, to the sector. So I just want to ask that we reconsider and as a portfolio committee look at that. But well done to the tribunal and the commission for their good work. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Secretary, I'm not sure if ever there's still any further hands. There's still a hand. Ms. Mutahoum, Chair, would like to uh, ask a question, Chair. Okay. Honorable Mutahoum. Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Um, I have only one question to the, co the Commission. I just want to check with the Commission, how did the pandemic affect uh, the impact on your fiscals and how that you have, no, I just wanted to double check uh, how did the pandemic affected the impact on your fiscal pass? Now that you have a lot of cases versus the number of investigators that you have, when one checking the delay on some of the cases to be finalized. Thanks, Chair. Chair, can, can no I then? Questions, Chair? Okay, no, thank you very much. So, so can we just ask uh, DDG, Dr. Pule, um, we would actually then ask you in terms of picking up on the comments and questions from members to actually then actually have that dialogue or discussion, maybe actually guide uh, the, us through the members of your team in response to and comments to the questions, Dr. Pule. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to the members of the committee. Um, there are quite a number of questions, um, um, and most of them from my notes here, Chairperson, seem to be directed to the Competition Commission. So um, I can't read all of them out. I hope that the, the Commissioner, I, I, no, no, I know that the Commissioner is probably has, has noted them. There were a few that I thought before I hand over to the commissioner, um, I could just pick the address and then we'll hand over to the commissioner because there's a couple for him. And they um, the chairperson, I noted a question for the chairperson of the tribunal from and that the Honorable Mbuyani on the turnaround times on the cases. Uh, there was an issue around water and sewer cartel, I believe. Commission could also deal with that. There was a question specifically around uh, how BEE legislation affects the decisions of the tribunal, I believe it was, from the Tenguyani. And then there was also an issue around, um, so I think those were the ones directed specifically at the tribunal, if I'm not wrong. Um, um, Chairperson will correct me if I'm wrong. Then 
most of the issues really were um, for the commissioner. Uh, Honorable Tring mentioned one witness in dealing with monopolies for the commissioner. It was the issue around victims of price gouging and so how are fines issued, but how is the victim recompensated? It was the issue around the and correction of the prices that we did towards the employment of the commission and the interventions and others which we can just check. The one that I wanted to start with, um, I think there were two chair that uh, the department would want to just quickly address. Um, Honorable Tring asked the question around foreign employees. How does the act protect locals from illegal foreigners? I think chair, um, and, and I think um, that the Bonagale will come in also with his take on this one, but it's an issue that has previously been uh, discussed um, by my recollection in PC. And, and, and the, the bigger context really around that issue, Chairperson, is firstly the sensitivity around um, the, the, the recognizing foreign nationals who live and work legitimately in South Africa. I think that's an important part to recognize that you know, there are foreign nationals who live among us as South Africans, legitimately so. Um, individuals, obviously, Chairperson, who are in the country on illegal grounds are subject or should be subject to the necessary legal pro pro processes. Um, my, to my recollection, to my knowledge, Chairperson, the Competition Act does not necessarily say anything about foreign employees or foreign illegal nationals. Um, and, and I think the emphasis here should be on illegal because I think we can agree, Chairperson, that those foreign nationals who are legal in the country are legal in the country and they've got the necessary rights and responsibilities that go with that legal status. Um, so, so I think that's that's one part. I think the other part of, of the, 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 the response, Chairperson, should really be around emphasizing the positivity of the act in that as opposed to necessarily being against a particular um, category of, of, of citizens or uh, people in the country, um, they really the emphasis should be on what the act stands for as opposed to what it stands against. And I think what it stands for primarily is how do we work within the laws of the land to ensure effective participation for all uh, people residing in South Africa in economic activity in a fair and, uh, and just manner. I think that's the, that's the priority. Now, the, the one part I think, and this is where I think uh, James Hodge might also have something to say around um, specific specific recommendations, for instance, coming out of um, activities such as the market inquiries, the grocery retail market inquiry being an example, would, would for instance, uh, look at addressing specific aspects or specific behaviors that have been identified in the economy as being anti-competitive as an, as an illustration. Um, one of the recommendations of the grocery retail market inquiries around, and this is not illegal persons, but illegal counterfeit goods, as an example. And I'm just going on the theme of the illegality, uh, Chairperson. Uh, and so where there are such um, findings, such recommendations that need to be followed up, um, the department, uh, the, the, the commission, uh, as, as, as Commissioner Bonagele, rightfully say, often we, we underestimate and we underemphasize the advocacy work done, really. We would work with relevant stakeholders and, 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 and agencies to ensure that those are, I mean, in the case of the grocery retail market inquiry, um, just to continue on that theme, we are currently in engagement and discussions with the South African Revenue Service to look at illegal counterfeit goods in the grocery retail market uh, value chain. Um, so I think I think that that really um, chair is, is 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 the response to that the recognition that we look at that within the bigger context um, and sensitive to our experience in the country previously around issues of xenophobia and making sure that in handling anything around foreign nationals in our country we handle it with sensitivity with the necessary um, empathy but also firmly within the prescripts of the law I think that that's an important portion. Um, then, then the second um, issue, um, which I look at, uh, Commissioner Bonaki, because I think there's a several points, is around the appointment of two deputy commissioners and, and the issue there raised by uh, 
member of the committee, Mem Mantashi, was around, given the budget, how is that going to be managed? Um, and, and that's a very important point because the director general often makes this point that we, we live in an environment and in a time where physical, fiscal, fiscal austerity is, is a priority. And therefore, any, any intervention that um, we're going to implement, the minister and the DG are going to implement in the oversight responsibility on the entities will obviously be done within the context of that fiscal environment. Now, we, 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 as, as, as was also mentioned by the member when she asked the question respectfully, she also acknowledged that we, we need to acknowledge the criticalness of these posts, but we need to make sure that when we do those appointments, we do those appointments in the context of what is affordable versus in the context of what is required. Um, and, and, and therefore, really, we cannot argue with that point, Chair. That's a very fair point. That's a very valid point. That's a point that echoed. The, the question specifically was how are we going to handle it? The manner in which the DG is guiding and the minister for us to handle it is to look at the, 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 the entire context of what is required by the entities and to be able to make a balanced decision in terms of what needs to be done. At the moment, Chair, um, there are two acting deputy commissioners and um, supporting the commissioner at the moment. And therefore, there's still scope for the minister and the DG to apply their minds, considering what are the priorities. And, and we know now that, for instance, with the medium-term strategic framework being revised, the president having issued the economic recovery plan and others, we also have to look at, we're in the middle now as well, Chair, um, 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 conveniently of finalizing annual performance plans and the like. We have just finalized annual reports. So we are in a very good uh, environment and time now to look at all the issues that could impact on whether uh, those two additional DCs are appointed. Of course, that's a ministerial prerogative, but but uh, minister and DG obviously will take advisement in terms of the practicality. So it will, it will be handled by looking at the entire context of what is required. We are very much conscious of the fiscal environment. Um, and it's, it, it, I mean, the pinch is getting stronger and stronger, but as it gets stronger and stronger, one thing that um, I've heard the commissioner say repeatedly, we also have to be creative about how we handle the demands that are put on the end um, chairperson. Now, I don't know, I, I do not think there's anything else for now, okay? um, but, um, but I think the department, there was, of course, we, we wish to um, echo, um, and, 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 and on behalf of the DG, I think I should acknowledge member Herman's point around acknowledgement of the good work of the commission and the competition tribunal we appreciate that and 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 also perhaps the commissioner might want to chime in on this one acknowledge the point that um, 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 she raised around the issue of the 10 percent penalties and that the pc might want to look at this further um those those are the issues for now i would like to hand over now to commissioner bonakel i think there were specific issues which were addressed and then finally appeal to the chairperson of the tribunal as well, if she would like to respond. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and again, with your permission, I'll, I'll ask my colleagues to assist me in, in uh, responding to the questions. Uh, specifically here, I noted there was a question about uh, the stickiness of prices uh, going down. Uh, and I think the chief economist may, may enlighten all of us uh, here. Uh, we, we are all have observed from his presentation uh, this point about the prices taking time to come down uh, once they go up, even when the costs uh, go down. And so that's, that's really an, an economic uh, question I, I may need um, assistance in addressing, but. Uh, 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 the deputy commissioners are also here. They can assist where, where they need to. With your permission, Chair, if I can ask James to, to go ahead. Yes, that's in order, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, in fact, I think the, the announcement uh, which the Commissioner made around an agreement with Pick and Pay today and ShopRite, um, which was confirmed last week, is an important part of addressing price stickiness because the extent of competition in grocery um, matters. And what we have noticed is that there are higher margins 
for fresh produce um, for bakery and, and butchery where convenience may matter and where the exclusion of, of even these specialist stores that may compete in shopping malls, convenience centers nationally um, enable uh, supermarkets to keep prices high and not be as responsive. So I think that those agreements will take us a long way in towards starting to address this. But there are also differences in power and, and um, economic power in the, the, the food value chain. And we've noted the importance of that food value chain and participation and concentration in that in terms of the recovery plan. And so this is a focus for us. And um, you know, just to provide some example, which also goes to the point um, around fairness in the economy and, and the, the, the new amendments. Um, but a lot of the amendments around buy power and price discrimination are precisely to ensure fairness so that those who enter can expand and become competitors one day. And that is, is I think, the important element of supporting SMEs and historically disadvantaged persons um, in the economy with that longer term goal of more dynamic competition. But to provide an example, um, you know, of enforcement of biopower during the COVID, with the immediate lockdown, there were a number of dairy processes that announced immediately the imposition of levies on dairy farmers, um, or the removal of some of the price benefit premiums that they had, they had um, previously had. And that was done unilaterally without consultation, and in fact, without even um, examination of the true costs of having to deal with the lockdown situation and the true impact on, on their own products. So swift action from ourselves ensured that that balance between, between the process and the farmer was maintained, that consultations did take place, and any additional charges that, 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 that were required or adjustments to the market were done collectively, um, and, and that did result in far less harm. Had we not had those powers which were passed in the amendments and had not acted, then it's quite feasible that a much of the almost impact, negative impact of COVID would have been on dairy farmers, which would have cut production ultimately um, and shrunk the sector in the long run. So, so I think the, you know, the actions around competition um, in the food value chain and addressing those bottlenecks and concentrations are an important part of addressing that price stickiness. Um, because even if prices would have come down to dairy farmers, they weren't coming down from the processor to the retailer either. Hopefully that answers some of that, that question. Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Chair. I wonder if the Deputy Commissioner wants to say something, then I'll switch quickly. Okay. okay. So thank you, Commissioner, and uh, to the Chairperson and members of the committee. Uh, and thank you again for for the encouraging messages of, of support and recognizing the work we are doing as the commission. And there are questions I will I will tackle, and then of course the commission has said you you will do the sweeping. But I thought we should start with this question of distribution because this is the core of of what we do as the competition commission. This is the core of the competition act. The Competition Act is, is uh, designed to address injustices of the past and exclusion. Uh, this is not just uh, looking at illegal monopolies that we have successfully uh, broken up, particularly those involved in cartel activities. Uh, this is to address the apartheid legacy of exclusion which shows uh, even today in the nature of the markets we see uh, highly concentrated uh, structures of the markets structures that uh, exclude uh, smmes uh, from participation uh, in markets so the issue of distribution it's a constitutional imperative and indeed the Competition Act is meant to ensure that our markets uh, are competitive, our markets are inclusive, and you can see in the nature of the amendments uh, that 
we have now, these amendments pay specific attention to uh, implementing measures to promote access to SMEs. So the two uh, are not uh, mutually exclusive. So we focus on on distribution, and uh, I've been looking at the charts uh, from Honorable Mundla. Uh, this is not the distribution. It's not the distribution we, we are talking about. There has to be an equitable distribution uh, of resources, uh, fair opportunities to participate in markets. And this talks now to the question and I've tackled issues of cartels. There are indeed, of course, uh, monopolies and oligopolies that we uh, still have to, to tackle, but there are new ones as well. So the the law is continuously being refined. The commissioner has, uh, uh, you know, aptly presented the kinds of challenges we faced uh, in uh, tackling abuses of dominance, and we we hope and we have started seeing uh, some successes in courts uh, on abuse of dominance. Uh, we eagerly wait the ruling in the Babalehi matter on excessive pricing because uh, this case would uh, definitely uh, uh, give us a clarity on, on how we should be, uh, and hopefully it does so, uh, because if it doesn't, there would be uh, serious consequences uh, uh, for, for enforcement. So we... Um, okay. I found this on the web. We have, uh, there's a question uh, from Honorable Nguyane on private health care. I'll be very brief on this because we have conducted the health market inquiry. The report has been released, and I know, uh, Chair, that um, we, we are yet to brief. I think we have, if you correct me, whether we have fully briefed you on this and, and, and subsequent implementation of the private uh, healthcare inquiry. Indeed, there are huge challenges uh, of licensing. There are huge challenges of competition in the private uh, uh, healthcare markets that we, we have to uh, attend to uh, as the commission. And issues of, uh, I think the eucalyptus matter, we would, we would be, you know, we would look at this again uh, uh, Honorable Mantashe, and, and, and I think you're welcome to, to provide uh, further information uh, to the Commission on this. And lastly, I would, and I think the Commissioner would look at other questions. I would just touch on this. Uh, there was a question by Honorable Thring on the 20% uh, that we imposed in various uh, uh, consent orders subsequently confirmed by the tribunal. Uh, the 20% was to restrict the margin. So we kept the gross margin from 20%. So where firms were earning excessively high margins uh, for these uh, uh, essentials, uh, essential products we identified, we reduced these margins significantly and required them to cap uh, these 20%. Uh, and we didn't have uh, res you know, uh, resistance. So our Bottom line was to ensure that the firms do not earn excessively high margins. And we have seen uh, successes because uh, there has been a lot of price stability uh, in some uh, uh, of these uh, uh, you know, products, particularly you know, in the pharmaceuticals where we're having a whole lot of other challenges and you've seen in retail uh, some stability as well. But there are other residual issues uh, that we are tackling outside uh, outside of this. So, Commissioner, I, I would, thought I would just cover those, uh, but I can cover more if, if you want. I'm just looking at the time as well, uh, that maybe you can cover the rest. Thank you, indeed, I, I will. Uh, Chair, uh, I, I nearly forgot uh, the Deputy Commissioner mentioned uh, the complaint by the Honorable Mandashi. Is perhaps fair to give the manager responsible to, 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 to make, uh, to, to give an answer to Honorable Mandashi because we've made some progress with it in relation to that complaint. I don't know if Kanye is here to update uh, uh, Honorable Mandashi on that, on that specific uh, complaint. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, good morning to the honorable members. Um, so the complaint from uh, Honorable Mantashe uh, has been investigated and the team uh, is coming to a conclusion on the matter. Uh, essentially, this was about eucalyptus oil, as she has mentioned, which uh, is a product which uh, is used pharmaceutically to bring a relief you know, for cold and flu symptoms and particularly pertinent during this COVID period. And um, so the complaint uh, related to uh, a price hike, which seemed excessive relative to uh, other retailers in the area. This is um, uh, Queenstown, uh, Staterheim uh, area. So a general trader, uh, they had been selling these from uh, 50 Rand initially, uh, but moving them up to 150 Rands for a 50 milliliter bottle. So on our engagement with um, the, the, the respondent, um, it became apparent that initially he sourced uh, the, his supply from Masmat uh, at a much uh, lower cost. Um, he started trading this from July uh, 2020, uh, but uh, Masmat soon ran out of stock and it seems there was a shortage of stock uh, in general uh, on this particular product, which we understand is quite uh, popular. Um, he therefore sourced uh, his supply from an informal uh, trader in the area. Uh, we even tracked down uh, his name is uh, Mr. Sbusiso, and we could not uh, get uh, uh, his surname. But essentially, uh, you know, he explains then the higher charge based on his new supply line or supply chain in the, uh, short, in the absence uh, of stock from uh, conventional uh, suppliers. And um, of course, this is a small trader and um, the turnover is, uh, you know, around 600,000 rand per annum. He was not even able to produce uh, financial statements uh, to us. So certainly, um, you know, falls under that threshold, which the commissioner uh, had indicated for prosecution uh, of 5 million uh, rands. But nevertheless, you know, we, uh, you know, did engage with him around uh, this conduct. Um, so he did... Um, uh, reduce or at least commit to reduce uh, his uh, prices uh, by 20%. We found that also when we calculated the profits, excess profits that he had made, uh, you know, in these last few months uh, that he was trading at the higher volumes, um, you know, relatively speaking, because of the small volumes, he had sold about 30 of these, uh, between 30 and 40. Um, you know, they were also uh, of quite a low threshold, uh, you know, for further prosecution, but we did engage and I think, um, you know, there was a sensitization on his part uh, around uh, these issues of um, uh, price gouging and excessive uh, hiking of prices. Um, but, you know, the team has uh, engaged uh, with the, the honorable member, uh, you know, particularly in the initial stages of the of the investigation. I think we even sent a courtesy letter, uh, but we will be giving uh, you more detailed uh, feedback uh, on the conclusion of this matter once we have tied up uh, the loose ends on our side. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much. If I may quickly now uh, uh, um, do the last questions, uh, Chair. I think the issue of uh, foreigners was addressed by the DTG. Uh, sorry, Chair, I think I was uh, muted at some stage. Uh, on the question of foreigners, I would just provide information without debating the issue, uh, just for honorable members to follow some of the developments. I think a major development regarding uh, uh, foreigners is this clause in the amendment bill, which was discussed by the DTG, which uh, subject certain sectors of the uh, economy uh, that are regarded as security sensitive to a process of approval by the executive in case there is a merger by a foreign firm. Uh, the second uh, issue uh, to watch, uh, which we will be watching as a commission, uh, is, is a bill that has been introduced by uh, Houghton province to restrict uh, the participation of foreigners in the retail sector in certain parts uh, of um, of uh, uh, the province, like uh, uh, townships. 
Um, as far as the Competition Act is concerned, uh, uh, there are no other specific uh, provisions regarding the protection of locals. I thought just what I should provide that information. Um, the issue around uh, the, the, the uh, role of the Competition Act in distribution has been, I think, adequately addressed. I could just uh, uh, make a further example to illustrate this point uh, because uh, our chief economist uh, discussed the issue of the relationship between farmers and processors. Pro processors uh, buy uh, uh, the milk from farmers and often possess uh, market power. They dictate prices that power that farmers uh, pay. Uh, and so um, our interventions in a sector like that does have a distribution effect because essentially you are wanting to distribute uh, uh, um, where the surplus goes uh, between the farmer and the, the, the processor. Uh, and so the issues of distribution, uh, yes, do include uh, race, but they go far beyond that. Uh, uh, there are many uh, dairy farmers uh, SMMEs uh, who come to us, black and white farmers who come to us uh, and say that uh, you need to promote distribution uh, in the milk uh, value chain because uh, it's unfair, uh, the power is tilted uh, more in favor of the uh, processors and retailers. So competition uh, by its very nature uh, does impact on the distribution, you know, it's about uh, uh, the share uh, of the of the of the surplus uh, generated by an economic activity. Now the issue also of the the, the, the budget I think has been uh, ably uh, uh, has been uh, uh, raised and the DDG is here. Uh, I should just mention because I want to combine this question with the question uh, raised by the honourable Mutaong. Uh, I think it would be unfair of me not to uh, indicate to the committee that um, indeed the lockdown period uh, has been quite a challenging one for our staff. Uh, they've had to do all of these investigations uh, which were not on, on the original uh, plans. Uh, we've had uh, people uh, moving around uh, divisions where they were working to focus just on these uh, cases. Uh, and it did put a lot of strain on our staff. You will recall that we had to be all over the country, literally. Uh, there were no planes that were flying at the time. People had to drive long distances conducting the investigations. Uh, we had to uh, uh, get people into risky places like uh, uh, stores uh, at the height of the COVID-19. And also just the way uh, that the, the shutdown operated uh, induced quite a lot of stress because people had to work from home. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, yes, it has had a huge impact on our uh, uh, budget uh, situation, on our funding, but also it has had quite a, a huge psychological uh, uh, impact for, on our staff. Uh, I think the, even the idea of working uh, from home, uh, I don't know, I mean, in our organization, uh, we've had, for example, uh, to introduce um, a, a psychologist a, a service provider who is working with, with our people uh, because uh, we've noticed that there are also there is an increase in uh, mental health uh, uh, issues. Uh, so I, I think that the, the, there's a there's a whole. Uh, uh, briefing we can make just outside of cases about the impact uh, of this on, on the people, on our people, on the budget uh, and uh, on, on our operations. Uh, I can feel it um, myself. I know for sure that I'm working under more severe strain now uh, than I did uh, before the lockdown. And uh, uh, DTG has explained, for example, that we do have uh, uh, acting uh, deputy uh, commissioners uh, and uh, they too have been under strain. I mean, uh, 
uh, to be acting means that you are having two positions uh, that you are responsible for. And uh, in the case of the commission, those positions come with a lot of work. Uh, uh, and so I think, uh, yes, we, we will have uh, more discussions with the department uh, about this, but I think the, the questions from honorable members are, are definitely uh, uh, spot on. Uh, on the question of the, 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 the fishing uh, uh, industry, uh, yes, we, we have been engaged a lot uh, about this industry. Uh, we, we, we think that uh, dominance in this industry is partly also a function of uh, the, the distribution of fishing rights uh, by the responsible department. Uh, it's true that uh, it's, a, it's a fairly concentrated uh, sector. Uh, the department has now, only just now, uh, uh, through our engagement, started uh, reserving some of the fishing rights for smaller fishing uh, communities and uh, companies coming from, from those areas. Uh, we've seen a lot of consolidation, particularly on the processing side uh, of fish. Uh, I think that uh, we can and we've done uh, some work as the commission on this, but all I'm saying is, honorable members, that this work could be made much easier uh, by uh, making sure that because the fishing sector is a regulated sector, uh, because those fishing rights are, are, are issued by the state. Uh, and I think that we can, if we can tighten it there, uh, we would address a lot of the other uh, issues. And Honorable Muyane, we, we would be, uh, uh, this is an area where we could take a whole hour briefing you uh, on all the cases. Uh, there's a whole history uh, uh, here, but you ask what one there are. There are a lot of problems in the, in the fishing industry. And uh, just on the, uh, 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 on this uh, uh, question that uh, I think, uh, uh, has been taken up by the committee around fines. Uh, I would like that maybe you add uh, some of the questions that keep coming about penalties, uh, about why the penalties go to the national revenue funds and are not used to remedy the, the damages uh, that are caused in markets by these monopolies and cartels. Uh, again, that's a, that's a, that's a legislative uh, matter. Uh, the fines do go to the National Revenue Fund uh, and National Treasury is very protective of that process. Uh, and there is something, there is nothing uh, much we can do about it. It's a, it's, it's a matter of legislation. Uh, I think that uh, um, the, the, the issue uh, around uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the sewer and water uh, uh, issues. Also, I, I, I note here that we have a lot of concerns that we have received uh, from uh, uh, the department itself that's dealing with this, uh, but also uh, we've had in the past uh, investigations uh, here uh, around the supply of uh, water treatment uh, chemicals. We have a, a fairly concentrated uh, a market there with only a few players where the water utilities and municipalities uh, have to buy the chemicals. So there's a real chain that we are looking at. Uh, there is also a lot of uh, 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 suspected catalyzation of the provision of engineering services uh, for water treatment works uh, and the likes. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a work uh, that we would be faced, we would be having a, a major project on uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, Chair, I think uh, we've covered um, almost everybody. My apologies up front if I've missed uh, uh, anything, but thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm sure a uh, commissioner will be checking with the tribunal chair, if ever there are any issues. Um, before we go back to Dr. Pule.
Okay, I put cases for the webinar. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm just, yes, yes. Um, I was just checking uh, DDG if, if ever there's any comments uh, from the uh, tribunal. If not, I'm sure we'd actually try and ask you to round up. Okay. Yes. Okay, there's two members who would like to follow up questions, Chair, Mr. Mbuyani and Mr. Fink. Okay. Um, all right. Can, can we take um, Honorable Mbuyan and Honorable Tring in that order? Yeah, Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there's this issue of triple PE policy. Uh, how does it influence adjudication in terms of the tribunal? I'm not, I was not covered on that one. And also, Chairperson, on the two issues that I've raised, uh, it's not for the first time raising this issue. And the very same department is dealing with the matter, is dealing with the matter, the issue of water and sewer, and the issue of healthcare in private sector. Uh, I don't. I don't think even even if the, if the department is dealing with the matter, the matter can drag to this to, to this law. Even update, I can get an update. How far are they in terms of checking or investigation the dominance? Uh, probably they are agreeing with me that there are regulatory uh, some 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 glitches there. But what is it that they've done currently? Because really this is concentrated. People have got dams, but there are people that is, don't have water. How do you justify that in the Republic of South Africa, Chairperson? Thank you. Honorable Green. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Mine is just a fairly simple question. I think um, one of the presentations, the mention was made of uh, some of the fresh produce where there were some price hikes. And one of those um, fresh produce was, was I think, it, uh, ginger. Um, and I can recall my wife mentioning that just prior to lockdown, uh, the price of ginger was around about 70 to 80 rand a kilo. Um, and then a week or so into lockdown, uh, she had to purchase it for in the region of about 140 rand. So there was almost like a 100% increase uh, in in the price, it's 140 rand per kilo. So within this within the space of a week, uh, you had that 100% increase. I'm just interested to know, much like with and now this is in your major the major supermarkets, you know your pick and pays, spas and checkers and so on, uh, where we've seen these particular uh, price hikes. Thank you, Jay. So my question is, is, I just wanted to know whether there's I heard that there was an investigation into the ginger. What was the outcome? Okay, uh, DDG, Dr. Pule, if I can go back to you and then uh, let's actually get uh, the commissioner and the tribunal to, if ever there are any further points. Dr. Pule? Uh, sure. Your line is bad, uh, doctor. Is it not clear? No, much better now. Oh, I was saying, I was saying, can we request the chair, tribunal chair? Because I think the issues that that then we had, one of them is was for her, and then I think I don't know if Commissioner Bonakela wants to come back on the water and sanitation, and then the fresh produce will be James Point from the commission. And then, uh, chairperson tribunal. Thank you, DDG. Um, the question from Member Mbuyani to the tribunal was about uh, the uh, length of time it takes to complete cases. The second question is a question that was asked in the second round, uh, and I didn't quite get that question about BEE. So if uh, Member Mbuyani could uh, repeat that question. In the meantime, uh, with your permission, Chair, I'll proceed to answer the first question which is about uh, the tribunal turnaround times on cases. I think when one looks at uh, the turnaround times, there are two aspects to look at it from. One is from the merger side of uh, uh, our work, and the other is from prohibited practices side. On the merger side of things, um, I don't have the figures with me, but uh, the tribunal substantially meets the timeline stipulated in the act in terms of uh, 
deciding uh, managers, uh, even with the uh, constrained capacity that it, that it does have. In respect of prohibited practices, um, the Act doesn't st stipulate time periods uh, for the completion of those matters, but the factors that do affect and impact the turnaround times uh, from a tribunal perspective are, are numerous, and I'll just mention a few of them. One of them is uh, the issue of the complexity of the cases. If one looks at our statistics, and I don't have those uh, in front of me, in general, you find that in respect of cartels and, 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 and behavior that uh, is, is, is uh, competition violations that are egregious, which um, also are supported by the commission's leniency policy, those cases tend to move quicker because uh, the evidence is there and uh, the parties come forward to confess. In respect of um, abuse of dominance in particular, that uh, area involves quite complex economic and legal analysis. And so even before the, the tribunal gets to hearing the matter, often the uh, case takes long because the parties themselves are contesting various aspects uh, of the case. So the complexity of the matter is basically one reason why the delays in um, decision-making come about. The second is also related to interlocutory uh, proceedings that also tend to delay matters. So interlocutory proceedings are um, applications where parties bring cases uh, or request information before the matter can proceed to its merits. And some of those uh, matters will, for instance, be for access to documents uh, before the parties can then go on to the merits. Sometimes it's jurisdictional issues um, that are sometimes appealed to higher courts. And therefore, before you can even begin hearing the merits of the case, um, one would have then had to deal with those uh, interlocutory uh, applications. And what we do see, uh, again, the statistics are not here, is that there's a correlation between the complexity of the case and uh, the number of interlocutory proceedings that happen. So the more complex the cases, the more there's a contestation before even the hearing about uh, access to documents, about jurisdiction, about a whole number of uh, procedural matters that need to be addressed. So that's the second reason. And then the third reason is the issue of member capacity as well. We have also been operating under very tight uh, um, uh, um, numbers. Uh, there are four tribunal members, and the four include myself as the chair and the deputy chair and two tribunal me members. So the cases that I referred to earlier that I was mentioning the tribunal has been dealing with during this lockdown has primarily been on the um, shoulders of those four members. And again, just to remind members that the um, tribunal matters require a seating of three members per case. So as I sit here today um, in, 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 in this um, uh, presentation, the other three tribunal members are hearing cases in the tribunal, and that's the full extent of of, of, of the members. So the three of them are hearing cases this morning. And um, part of what happens then after the reasons, as you would appreciate, is reason writing. That also requires a lot of quiet time of actually um, doing reason writing. So there's a whole number of factors that, that cause delays. We do have part-time members. The part-time members, um, have been able to assist uh, during this lockdown period because uh, they are able to work from home and therefore have been more available uh, to, 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 to assist on the cases. The part-time members are six uh, part-timers and one is not entirely in control of their time in terms of their availability to the tribunal. And we are not in control also of when matters come before us to plan with the part-timers as to their availability. So it's a situation that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis, and we, um, I think, uh, have managed to comply as much as possible to the um, to, 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 to the timelines with the limited uh, constraints. The DDG mentioned um, earlier that the, the, 
the pinch is getting stronger, and I can uh, confirm that from a tribunal perspective in terms of the work that we have handled in this period um, and our limited capacity in terms of the number of people who can sit on the cases. If member Mbuyani could then uh, repeat uh, for my benefit the second question on, on BEE, then I'll answer that question. Okay, Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, thank you very much. It's a very straightforward question, Chairperson. Uh, I just want to check how uh, do BEE policy influence the tribunal adjudication in terms of measures and public interest? Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Chair, Tribunal Chair. Yes, uh, uh, Chair, we, we, we do look into BEE. We are required in terms of the Act uh, to look at uh, BEE uh, in, in merger assessments. And some of the cases that I referred to in the slides that I put up earlier do address that issue squarely where uh, the BEE elements come in various forms. One that I mentioned specifically, which I um, indicated was a new one under the uh, amendment is one that looks at uh, the levels of worker ownership in the firms that come before us. And in the Simba matter, that uh, was a matter that squarely came before us. And um, there was a condition to ensure that uh, the workers will have uh, ownership in, in, in the merged entity. And the focus was also on uh, historically disadvantaged persons. There are numerous other matters in the slides where BEE, also from a perspective of small businesses, is also taken into account um, in considering uh, mergers. And in respect of prohibited practices, and that's an area where it's difficult to know wh whether the impact is on small businesses directly as opposed to in merger cases. However, it's a constant uh, uh, prism through which we look at transactions uh, and complaints before us as we are required in terms of the act. Dr. Pule, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, Chair, I think there was one more question around uh, the ginger. I think the import has demonstrated the fresh produce from Honorable Tring. Uh, James, do you want to cover that? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, DDG, there's also a question about the water rights. If maybe Bate can quickly address that as well. No problem. Thank you, Commissioner. Ndade Bake, you'll be up next after James. James, please proceed. Thanks, DDG. On, on the price of ginger, what happened in the wholesale markets, and this is covered in our price monitoring report, is that ginger in wholesale markets and fresh produce markets went up to around 90 rand kilogram um, in that first week of lockdown. And, and the regulations, in effect, look at whether there is an increase in the margin charge and whether that has a cost justification. So if the, if the retailer had charged, for instance, a 40% a margin um, on ginger historically, and the price of ginger doubles, and they retain that margin, then the price increase will be large. But there's very little we can do in terms of the regulations. That is something we've learned from this process, that sometimes you know, very large cost increases um, result in very large absolute margin increases and it's something we have noted, um, but I think the legally tractable rule is, is and, and the common one globally, is around whether the margin increases or not. So that would explain why, why the price of ginger went up and why we would be limited in our ability to enforce against that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, perhaps. Dr. Pule? Uh, I was going to give uh, a Chief Legal Counsel by Kema Denge, but I see Chairperson of the Tribunal wanted to say something. Chairperson, do you want to clarify something? If it was just to add uh, to, to what James has said um, about the prices of ginger, uh, from the Tribunal perspective to say that some of the consent orders that we have 
uh, confirmed that came from the commission where in respect of prices of ginger, um, where excessive pricing had definitely been confirmed and the fi firms concerned were found to have um, contravened the act. As to what the prices have done or will do afterwards, uh, we don't have sight over that aspect of things. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, with, your, with your permission, PC Chair, I uh, will go to Dr. Bakia, please, Chief Legal Counsel, Competition Commission. Yeah, thank you, uh, DDG Mulife, Chair and members uh, of the committee. Uh, I think Honorable uh, uh, Mbuyane raised a very important uh, question uh, relating to uh, water ownership uh, in South Africa. And um, South Africa is one of the few countries um, which has um, a private ownership uh, of water resources. Uh, in this regard, I think uh, Honorable Biana referenced, for instance, um, a dam ownership. And these questions, of course, of water ownership are inevitably linked uh, with questions of uh, land uh, ownership. Uh, in South Africa. So one cannot really uh, separate the two. Uh, so these issues are mainly um, uh, regulatory uh, issues uh, which are addressed uh, in the National uh, Water Act. And of course, what the National uh, Water Act seeks to do uh, is to try to ensure that uh, water resources uh, are under the custodianship uh, of, of the state. So that regulatory framework uh, in the National Water Act seeks to achieve that. So these issues have not really presented themselves uh, within our context as full uh, competition issues. But I think what is very much clear is that uh, they are really uh, regulatory issues uh, to do with um, uh, questions of, uh, of ownership of what really uh, is um, importantly a very scarce uh, resource uh, in our context. So it's an issue, of course, that, as, as I've said, is addressed. And then the issues relating to uh, um, uh, the sewer, of course, those are uh, reticulation as well as, again, uh, environmental issues, uh, which are also addressed uh, within the context of um, other uh, regulatory framework, but not necessarily and the competition uh, framework. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, TDG. TDG Pule. I think, Chair, we, we seem to have covered all the issues by my count here. Um, yeah. So the last thing really, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, on behalf of um, the Director General, the Minister, on behalf of the competition commissioner, the, the chairperson of the tribunal, we'd like to thank the PC for this opportunity to bring them up to speed in terms of implementation of the amendment act. Um, I have not noted anything at the moment that requires follow-up. I believe the issue around the eucalyptus was, was dealt with and was finalized, and that seems to be sufficient. Um, we note other comments um, such as from member Hermans around the penalties and others which probably would be taken up at a later point. But on that note, Chairperson, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to the PC. Thank you. Okay. Can, can I just say to the Portfolio Committee members that uh, that uh, concludes the discussion, but obviously um, DDG, we, we do have regular updates on most of these important uh, issues like actually engaging today's meeting of the Competition Commission and the Tribunal. So because we have those uh, going away and having the next session will mean we will actually update from what we engaged on here and be able to actually proceed. But if ever there's any specific issue that arises as a question that needs an answer, we generally would ask for seven days to get an update the, uh, the one of the Eastern Cape, you might find because there's still investigations that you can be able to give an update uh, to the committee of those kind of issues that uh, you know you're still working on giving a status 
uh, after our meeting within seven days so that at least we have a closing status. When we actually have a follow-up uh, meeting, we will actually then get an update moving forward. But knowing that is taken care of, it's quite crucial. So can I thank you, DDG and uh, the team, and maybe the portfolio committee members as well for the engagement. But further, I think uh, we will be actually engaging at the next level of what progress is on the basis of today's discussion. So I'm sure we will actually conclude our session uh, at that point. And maybe DDG, I'm not sure if ever you've got a parting shot. Uh, if you want to, we can actually then uh, allow you to do that. And on my part, I'll then move to the next uh, part of our process in terms of uh, closing of the meeting. DDG? No parting, no parting no. shot, Chairperson. Uh, okay. okay, great. Thank you very much. Honorable members, uh, Secretariat, I'm not sure if ever there'll be any issue you'd like to inform us on. Uh, but I think on our part, we will actually do have our portfolio committee meeting same time tomorrow uh, on different issues. Can I get secretary just to confirm that? And uh, I would like us to actually try and conclude our meeting at that point. Secretariat? Okay, tomorrow we will get an update on legislation with respect to the Protection of Investment Act and the Legal Metrology Act, Chair. It's the same process that we had today, Chair. Well, to honor members, uh, the, the uh, department and the commission, can I actually thank you and uh, for the committee, our meeting stand agent. Can we reconvene tomorrow at nine? Thank you very much. The meeting is agent. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. you chair. Long Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.